Um, okay, so I think that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you very much for all attending. Um, this is an RHI explained <coughs> event, uh, so I make no apology for the geekiness <coughs> of this morning. If you don't know what RHI stands for, or uh, in any other way he tours you, then you really should be here to very geekdom, nuts and bolts RHI. So hopefully you'll all uh, leave here having got something of value out this morning. Um, just uh, to let you know what the running order is this morning, um, just to say up front, it's very me-centric. So uh, first of all, I'll be doing a bit of a, a welcome and an overview of what the RHI is, is there for, what it's aimed to do. Uh, and then I'll look a little bit more at the actual money and the figures behind what the RHI, uh, how the RHI performs, uh, as that has quite a big impact on what it means for business uh, and um, how it's sort of going to be rolled out in the future. Uh, after that, I'll then be looking at domestic RHI, what we know about that, and the implications of business. Then we'll have a quick break. Uh, and then the rest of the morning before lunch, uh, which I'll be holding out as a big carrot for your attention, uh, we'll be covering off uh, what, what sort of some of the main changes have been to the commercial, or non-domestic, I should say, RHI um, over recent months, including some of the recent um, improvements uh, and expansions. And then finally, some uh, a little bit on the biomass sustainability regulations that we're coming in, and uh, quite a bit of detail about how you actually go through an RHI application uh, and what that might mean um, from off gens point of view. And then it's um, it's a networking lunch and opportunity to ask each other or me any questions you have about the RHI. So it really is a bit of a potted uh, history and we've stopped tour of, of both RHIs. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the morning, just put your hand up. I'll then grab my glasses, put them on, uh, and uh, I should be able to hopefully answer it um, or uh, take them away and answer it uh, a little bit later on. Um, so first of all, uh, a little bit about uh, me and Regen Southwest. Um, so Regen Southwest, for those of you that don't know, is an independent not-for-profit organisation. Um, we've been around for about 10 years supporting the growth of the renewable energy sector in the Southwest, and uh, that's doing that whilst growing jobs and the local economy at the same time. So we sort of sit behind the scenes um, a little bit, mainly speaking to businesses, local authorities and national government, trying to encourage renewable energy activity in the sector. Uh, I've worked for Regen uh, for three and a half years, the last couple sort of increasingly focused on, on renewable heat, uh, and obviously the RHI is a quite a big part of what I do. So all of the changes and developments uh, this morning that I'll be talking about are great because they keep me in a job. Um, so the way uh, that uh, Regen has been operating over the last couple of years is we sort of have uh, three main strands of, of um, focus, if you like. One is our membership uh, sort of side of things, where businesses can become members of Regen to uh, stay plugged into what's happening in the sector and also sort of support our missions, which are growing renewables, growing jobs in the economy. Uh, we also do individual sort of uh, partnership work with some larger firms, such as Royal Valley Farmers, um, who we feel can make a big difference to the sector and support um, uh, sort of some of the, the bigger, more strategic things that are happening. And lastly, and the, the reason why uh, the bulk of you are here today, is that we also run uh, or partners within bigger projects, um, but also have the same aim of, of supporting renewables energy efficiency. Um, so the project that most of you will recognise and are here today for is the Ready for Retrofit programme. Um, this is a three-year EU-funded program, so apologies to the Cornwall businesses that asked me if they could come today, and I said no. Uh, because of the type of EU funding it is, uh, Cornwall is excluded, unfortunately. But the rest of the region uh, is covered, and this is myself and my colleagues, most of which are here today. Uh, we have a remit to go and uh, offer support to 410 businesses in the southwest, um, of which um, a not insubstantial chunk of you are here today under the support that we offer. The idea being that uh, we are a, a trusted source of information uh, and regarding the energy efficiency in the renewable sector and uh, we sort of help you grow, help you understand what uh, opportunities there are in energy efficiency and retrofit. 
That's only one half of the programme. In fact, the other half of the programme is a capital fund, or uh, has been a capital fund, which is now uh, more or less fully committed. And the idea of that, not an insubstantial amount of, of money, was to help social landlords pay for actual measures rolling out. So the programme in its entirety was sort of twofold. One was to help actually stimulate some real work in the region, and the other was to actually help small businesses uh, upskill and hopefully gain access to some of that work that was happening. Um, so that's been the, the overall aim of the programme, and uh, we're sort of in the last year of that pro programme at the moment, uh, sort of coincidentally with the activity in the RHI, that's obviously been a big area of growth for businesses that look, we're looking to help support you. Okay, so uh, I mentioned um, when I first started talking that uh, I, I was kind of interested in the reasons why we have an RHI, and I know that sort of might seem a little bit fluffy and not very nuts and bolts, but Actually, I think when I start talking about the figures involved and the drivers behind the RHI, it become apparent as to how important they actually are. Um, I don't have a laser. Oh. Uh, so, renewables in the southwest is doing well, as the chart shows. We've had a drop in landfill gas, which has been a big component of the renewable energy um, uh, generation in the southwest. But obviously, uh, biomass, sorry, and solar PV. How much do you on now? There we go. Um, solar PV, wind and biomass have obviously uh, had uh, a bump a couple of years, stimulated in no small part by the feed and tariff from the RHI. So, overall, pretty good news. Um, however, this is where we are currently, um, down at sort of just over 3% of our energy in the southwest produced by renewables. If we carry on on the route that we are on without any sort of major changes, we're still going to be quite a long way short of the targets that we originally had for the Southwest, the 15% uh, renewable energy target by 2020. Um, so sort of this was work done by Regen last year just to illustrate that um, we do still have the potential to meet that 20, uh, 20 target of 15%, um, and, but it will be a mix of all the different technologies. There's never, there's never going to be a, a silver bullet here. Um, interesting though, though um, biomass renewable heat is a, is a major component of this, um, and I will go on to illustrate why in a second. Um, overall, so this is an interesting chart that um, Deb produced a couple of years ago, basically outlining where the UK fits in Europe regarding how we're doing um, with our greenhouse gas emissions. So this particularly is looking at the percentage of our renewable heat and, of our heating and cooling that we require as a country, what percentage of that is actually generated renewable. Um, and uh, as you can see, sort of Scandinavian countries, in particular Sweden, is up near sort of 70 percent. So 70 percent of their domestic uh, heating and cooling is generated from renewable sources. We're uh, we're down there. Uh, we're not quite. Not, yeah. Us and Poland. Um, you might not be able to see it from where you are, um, but what I find interesting is you can see there's sort of little little steps here where, com where countries have been improving that contribution over the last few years. Um, ours is, you know, sort of flatlined and then jumped a little bit. So even considering the fact we're very, very low down, we're not even particularly making any great sustained gains in this. So um, this is just to illustrate that, yeah, RHI is fantastic. Uh, we've got a huge amount to do. Um, I'd just like to say, actually, these slides will be made available <coughs> afterwards, as will a, uh, a video at some point uh, of, of the morning, so don't feel like you're going to scribble loads of notes. What I've also done is, on the slides themselves, uh, I've hyperlinked most of the bits of information that I've used, so uh, when you get the slides later on, you can always follow the links back to the source information that I've used, just to check that I wasn't making it. Um, so just to bottom out really where, where the UK is right now in terms of renewable energy, I say right now, two years ago. Um, 2012, we were about 12% of total energy consumption was from renewables. You can see a huge part of that is bioenergy. Um, so that's things like tracks being fed by biomass, um, transportation, things like that. Um, so 2012, 12%, we're still a long way off from the targets that we need to be, uh, and it is always a mix. So really, just uh, for the next couple of minutes, I'd like to kind of get the message across as to why we have a renewable heat incentive. What, if, what problem is it actually trying to solve? Um, so this chart is um, the entire energy usage for the UK from 2011. 
The important thing being the big red chunk is heat. So nearly half of every single unit of energy that the UK consumes is spent on heating stuff up, which is a pretty low-grade use for energy, ultimately. Um, that was about 712 terawatt hours in 2009, of which uh, 540 terawatt hours of that was heat demand from buildings, just buildings. Um, and it costs a lot of money. Um, some 20 billion a year is spent in this country on heating stuff up. Um, <clears throat> so what component of that big red chunk is done renewably? So that's, that's just heat now, um, 2%. So 2% of all the heat um, that we consume in the UK is generated renewably. The point of the RHI is to raise that to 12%. So that's, that's what the RHI is looking to do. That's the ultimate aim that, that DEC have ascribed to it. Um, but the slight problem we have with heat is actually, it's, it's all, in some ways, it's harder enough to crack than electricity. So you can see the blue line, that's the variation of electricity demand over the UK over a typical year. And red is obviously heat demand. We have things called summer and winter here. So obviously much, much harder to try and, and, and crack that particular nut of, well, how do we manage our heat production and deal with that heat demand? So it's, it's not an easy task to do, and that's possibly why the RHI is the world's first scheme of its type. Though there have been other similar schemes, this really is a bit of a, um, a world's first. Um, just to sort of kind of uh, hammer that point home a little bit, this is an interesting sort of chart. I don't entirely agree with, with Dex's way of kind of squishing axes and putting the stuff on the same chart to make it look good. But the, the main point really to recognise here that the red line is energy efficiency, or building efficiency as it's known. No units, that is in fact. Um, households is the blue line, so we're still building, not as fast as we were, but household numbers in the UK are increasing. In energy efficiency is increasing, which is great. Um, what you'll notice though is the jagged line at the top, um, that is domestic heat demand. So that's broadly been increasing up until uh, sort of mid 2000s and it's now taking a big dip. <coughs> the thing that I would sort of like to, to notice is, is this. So this is the average internal air temperature of the property. So we're doing quite well, we're building more households, but we're using less energy in each of those but comfort levels are raising too. So it's not as easy an equation just to say that our like for like heating is diminishing because actually we're choosing to have our heating on the same amount of time just to enjoy warmer properties. Um, obviously when you're looking at fuel poverty, that's quite an important and key point that shouldn't be lost. But for many other people, it is purely having your, um, your house at 19 degrees, not 18 degrees. So it's just, just to be aware of that. Um, from the way, from my sort of point of view, the, the things that I see the RHI is really tackling in the fact that we are going to have a domestic RHI, despite lots of to and fro is to tackle the blue bars on this chart, basically. The RHI is all about trying to switch people, space heating and water heating, away from fossil fuels onto something renewable. Obviously, there is sort of process heat and just industry heat included in there too, but the, the main bulk of what we're trying to fix is space heating and water heating. And the reason for that is, is this chart, which I do actually quite like, because it's, you know, there's quite a lot of numbers on this. Um, this is the whole pie, if you like, is the UK greenhouse emissions. That's the thing that we have a target against, currently for 2020. Obviously, there's a little bit of wobbling about what happens to that um, over the next few years and into 2030. But that's what we're trying to reduce. You can see that heat emissions, the big red part of that pie is a huge chunk of that. And the RHI is dealing with that blue section and that red section. So although it's only one scheme, the RHI has an awful lot of weight behind it to try and meet our greenhouse gas emissions. The reason I'm laboring that point is that there was never really that weight behind things like the feed-in tariff. So the feed-in tariff had a very different set of drivers. That was very much about public engagement, lots of PV on people's houses, lots of public engagement, people can see it, they can start to engage. However, Treasury were never particularly big fans of feed-in tariff because it didn't offer very cost-effective carbon savings for the amount that was being spent on it. Um, the RHI comes from quite a different place where Treasury like the amount of carbon emission reductions you get per pound spent. So the reason I'm sort of labouring that is to sort of say, the money behind this, and obviously when people are looking at renewable, renewable 
uh, energy in general, they're very keen to say, well, how long is this scheme going to last? Where's the money coming from? The money comes from a very sort of uh, well cemented in position here, asterisk, provided it actually delivers. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm finishing off with my 15-minute warm-up before I hand over to myself to do the next bit. Um, this is sort of a little patchwork that I did, and, and uh, it actually took me far longer than you might, might think to do this fairly basic diagram. But this is sort of the overall piecemeal um, uh, renewables and, and energy patchwork that, that the government is looking at delivering. So these are the incentives and also the more... Um, the more sort of strict measures that are, that are going to be constraining and encouraging more people to think about um, energy. So, obviously, RHI for non-domestic came in in November 2011. Um, the reason the bar finishes in 2015 is, although there's... Uh, well, I'll cover that in a second, actually. RHPP came in at the same time, which was a grant um, system, in effect, for domestic uh, renewable heat installations. That will turn into the RHI domestic later on this year. We've also got sort of focus on the private rental market coming in in the latter part of the decade, uh, where in order to rent out a property, it's, it's, uh, it's being proposed that it should have an EPC of the year above. That's quite a big stimulus for people to start looking at their housing stock. Green Deal is obviously up and running, as is Eco. The feed-in tariff is due to be supported until 2021, for new schemes, that is. And we've also got sort of smart meters entering into the piece. So we're kind of halfway down the road, if you like, of this longer term um, set of initiatives to, to get us to our targets in 2020. Um, okay, so that was sort of outlining what the RHI is there to do. Um, I think it's always worth having a little bit of a look at, okay, the, uh, the detail of how that's actually going to work in practice as it affects what government think about it and it affects what changes may be made in the future. So the, there's, there's two sort of main drivers really for the renewable heat incentive and I guess to cover myself, when I mention that over the next few minutes I mean non-domestic, just to get that out there. The non-domestic RHI is there to deliver 12% internal rate of return on people's investment. That's pretty good. Um, and that's why people quite like non-domestic RHI. Um, messages back from industry is that that's actually fairly achievable. And people are getting payback on their equipment six, seven, eight years. So in general, really good scheme. People are, are really quite pleased with it, especially high heat users. It's 20 years worth of support, and you will get a payment for every eligible kilowatt hour of renewable heat that you generate. So it's a pretty simple concept. Every eligible um, kilowatt hour used. Sorry. Generated. It's for every kilowatt hour used, not generated. Um, well, pick, uh, if you're a district heat, you don't get you don't get paid for what comes up for you. You pay for what goes into the pot. Okay, picked up my typo there. Thank you. Yes, it's paying for every elig eligible kilowatt hour of demand that you that gets metered. Although that has, yeah, there, there, yeah we'll come on to yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely right. So the way in which the, the renewable heat incentive work is very much focused on, on demand. So uh, you will be either deemed or metered, depending on which scheme you're using, um, about how much you have a need for that renewable heat, and it's that need that you need to pay for um, for every kilowatt hour. Um, so it used to be fairly simple in terms of how the tariffs were arranged. So there are a number of different technologies which are eligible for both um, schemes of the renewable heat incentive. Um, they uh, did sort of all have a fairly straightforward system of tariffs up until fairly recently uh, when there's been a bit of a complication sort of added in as we're moving into a new tariff system. For small and medium biomass though, the, the system hasn't changed. Um, there are two tiers that you'll notice. This is to try and stop people over generating uh, and earning far more money than their demand um, should stimulate. So there's what's known as a tier break, and that's at 1,314 hours, which DEC assumes is a, a typical heating season. So that's a sort of flat break. For everything you generate up to that number of hours, um, you'll get, um, if you're on small biomass, 8.6 pence per kilowatt hour. If you continue generating over that, because you have a particularly cold winter, or because you've just decided you want your, your um, factory floor at 40 degrees, 
then you'll still continue to get payments, but you'll only get them at 2.2 pence per kilowatt hour. So the point of that is to just try and um, ensure that people are, are actually generating what they need, not over-generating. Um, so that's the same for medium biomass too, there's a tear break there. Um, as I said, it's got a little bit more complex for, um, for <coughs> some technologies um, since, uh, since a sort of a review of this in September last year. Um, the government did say, though, if any tariffs were to go up, then they would um, include those on applications that had already been made since the 21st of January last year. Um, so for any installations that have gone in since the 21st of, or been accredited, I should say, after the 21st of January last year, um, then they will sort of um, feed into one of these uh, tariffs. So they will get a particular value up to uh, the point at which this comes into being, and then they will get a different tariff after. So it's slightly complex, but it's just to say that it isn't, it isn't a, a flat tariff at the moment, um, uh, unless your new installation went in after the 4th of December last year then we just go straight on to whatever the tariffs are at the moment. That was a very <laughs> complex <laughs> description of basically saying, just make sure, uh, depending when an installation went in, you're well aware of what the tariffs are because they're not as straightforward as they have been in the past. Um, in addition, there's been some additional technologies added um, and a little bit of um, splitting technologies out. So deep geothermal uh, now has its own tariff where it didn't before. Um, and there is also sort of uh, large uh, biogas tariffs now. So they've sort of just taken stock of what's being deployed where and amended the tariffs to suit. Um, the key thing to sort of be aware of really is, is um, no one's really taken a big hit on tariffs. So no one's really sort of seen <coughs> tariffs reduced as such. It's all been um, to either make it more fair, either introduce tier breaks or just bump up the, the tariff level itself. Um, the way that DEC tends to look at uh, the renewable heat incentive in terms of performance is overall budget. <coughs> so we know what the overall budgets are for the renewable heat incentive. The important thing to know that if there is any underspend of those in, each, in any of those years, then that underspend doesn't go any further and the RHI goes back to Treasury. Um, what we have seen is that in 2012-2013 had an annual budget for the entire RHI, so that includes RHPP2, of 133 million, and around 80% of that went back to Treasury because it wasn't spent. Um, fair enough, that was kind of a year after the scheme was, was started, very slow to deploy, etc. So you could kind of you know, argue that that's to be expected. But um, I think no one would really uh, argue with the point that the RHI isn't currently deploying at the rate that, that government was expecting and industry was hoping for. Um, so, because of that, we were expecting far greater than 430 million to be allocated to the renewable heat incentive this year, and it's kind of flatlined, it's stayed at 430 million. So, there is a real um, sort of, not sense of urgency here, but there's always a sense of if you're talking to clients, talking to consumers who are considering renewable heat, the message is always if you're considering it, do it now. There's no reason to delay. Um, this is a policy backed scheme. We know that we have budget allocated until 2015, 2016. At the moment, there is no budget allocated for renewable heat incentive after that. The intention was always to keep the scheme open to new applications until 2021. That may still happen, but again, as I said at the beginning, I think a lot of this depends on deployment, how much we're actually getting projects out there and making the best use of this fund which is available. So, um, yeah, budget is set until 2015-2016, so that's for any new applications coming in. After that, no budgets have been set as yet. And that, that's obviously not unusual because no department really knows what their budget is going to be after 2015-2016. But just to be aware that um, we've had a very slow start, and although things are picking up, the RHI is still underdeployed. Do you have any ideas of what it is, sort of, um, is that up to when, 2012 to... The whole of 2012, or was that 2013? Well, that was financial year. Okay. So, yeah, April to April, um, the, bulk, the bulk of it went back to Treasury. Okay. That's been improved in last year, um, but there is still money leaching out of the renewable heat <coughs> sector pot back to Treasury, which is obviously a position that none of us really want to be in. Um, it's hard, sort of, it's a hard fought for incentive. We want to make sure that it's absolutely maximising 
the amount of projects which are going in. Um, so part of, part of the reason, well, this is a quite an interesting chart because it shows the a number of full applications that have been made to the RHR uh, since it started. That's the blue line. So it sort of peaks um, in uh, sort of peaks early last year. And then the red line is the number of uh, accreditations which are actually made. So you can see that there is a discrepancy between the number of applications that are being put in and the number of those that actually end up being accredited. So there's obviously a bit of a, a disconnect there in between what people are expecting uh, to do regarding putting in an application or what Ofgem are happy with. And I'll come on to that in quite a bit of detail later on. You'll also notice that it was sort of a very set trend. Um, and then in uh, sort of October, November last year, huge dive. Some of you may be aware of the uh, slight hiccup that there was with biomass and Ofgem last year to do with the emission certificate. So at one point Ofgem was forced to come out to say that because of the way the regulations had been put in front of Parliament to do with the RHI, it actually transpired that the bulk of the boilers that were being tested by a test house to certain emission standards were being tested to a British, well, to a, an EN standard that they actually had, weren't able to meet because of, uh, I think it was a, a paragraph kind of space was missing in the uh, regulation of the way they were put in front of Parliament, which meant all boilers were being tested to over 500 kilowatt boiler standards, which of course most of the boilers from 0 to 499 kilowatts weren't able to meet. So basically what that meant was all of the applications Ofgem had had to stay on ice and couldn't be signed off until those regulations were amended. And that's why you see a huge drop in the amount of um, accredited capacity and the amount of um, uh, accreditations coming forward. That was resolved on the 13th of December, so uh, it is all back to normal moving forward. But it's just interesting to know that that kind of announcement was actually kept fairly under the radar. There wasn't a great deal of hoo-ha about that. had a huge impact on the scale of what was accredited. So, I think the key thing is it's never to really forget this is um, very, very closely bound to, to government. It's a very, very firm um, sort of policy that under, underwrites this, and that's why it's really crucial to understand what the policy drivers are, what the sort of money behind this is doing, and how it's kind of looking back to government to, to make sure that they're kind of getting positive messages the whole time. Um, as many of you are sort of aware, it's a bit of a biomass show at the moment, the Renewable Heat Incentive. Um, they've had 4,000 applications and only around 3,000 accreditations, but that has led to sort of some 600 megawatts of install capacity only over the RHI. As I say, that is considerably less than, than was hoped for. Um, one of the knock-on effects, though, of having one sort of range of technologies uh, have such a, a, a dominant part in the RHI is that we've sort of seen big overspend in particular bits of the budget that were allocated to different technologies. So small biomass, 173 odd uh, percent of its expended of its forecasted expenditure. Medium biomass, over 150 percent. Large biomass, um, very much under deploying, and then the others are all under 10 percent of what was envisaged that they would deploy. Um, you may remember from sort of the feeding tariff a couple of years ago that. It, a similar thing happened. And what we ended up with was sort of a snap feeding tariff review, uh, very unhappy industry because of the way that was carried out, um, legal objections, basically confidence dropping out the market because people had no idea what was going to be happening to the tariff, businesses not really knowing what was going to be happening to their investments, a huge amount of uh, repercussions for, for the sector. Um, so one of the good things about the RHI is that and that sort of came in round about the time that the feeding tariff reviews were, were happening, and they did learn from that. Um, so the way that the RHI is going to try and avoid having one technology run away with the budget um, and <coughs> soak up all that money looks really bad to the rest of government that you basically, you know, well, there's been a cock up here guys, one technology is using all the money, all these other technologies aren't getting a look in, this isn't really working as it's supposed to. The RHI to overcome that has got sort of a couple of um, a couple of things in place: digressions and a tariff review. Um, the idea of digressions, which may, may, many of you will probably be familiar with, 
is that it's an automatic, transparent system where, depending on how much gets deployed, a digression in the tariff that that technology receives, receives um, may kick in. And that can all be set out before the scheme starts. It can all be completely laid out in theory, as long as industry is well aware of how that deployment is going, um, you should be able to work out for yourselves if a, if a digression in any particular tariff is likely over the near future. That's, that's the point of it. The idea is then that in theory, there should be no need for any um, snap reviews about tariffs. There should be no need for any intervention from government. They've set it up, they put it out to market, it's up to you guys as the industry to deliver it. That, that's the purpose. Um, they sort of um, also belt and braces, tariff review that we've just had, which as I mentioned earlier on, has led to some of the tariffs being fiddled a bit, um, and also some tariffs being split or some tariffs being put up. Um, so in a sense, that's their sort of dual mechanism for making sure that the, the money stays where it should be. Um, so digressions are on paper, fairly straightforward. Um, so the amount of deployment in any one technology and the RHI overall is reviewed every three months. Um, there will only be a digression, regardless of, of whether the technology has uh, had huge deployment or not. There will only be a digression if overall the RHI is deployed more than 50% of what it's supposed to. Um, so if that 50% trigger is met, then you can start looking at each individual technology and assessing what the deployment of that has been. Um, this is where we've had a change quite recently, actually. So beforehand, it was mainly 150% for every technology. So if they delivered half as much again as they were supposed to, then it would kick in a 5% regression of that particular technology's tariff, hopefully damping down um, the investment opportunity for people and reducing the amount of new applications coming forward. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, what we've had very recently um, is that because biomass... Um, has been deployed so well, the government has decided that the biomass parts of the renewable heat incentive are quite a stable market, and therefore they don't need as much margin as 50% to, uh, to, to sort of help them deploy and to not start being a problem. <coughs> the idea of setting the triggers at 50% above deployment was to allow that flexibility in the RHI so that you didn't just suddenly deploy all of the ground source heat pumps you're expecting to, and then one more application goes in and then all of a sudden you have to drop the tariff value. The point of having, having them above was to give you that flexibility within each technology, so good idea. What they've now decided though, however, is that biomass is doing so well that 150% isn't really appropriate, so they've knocked it back, the small and medium biomass, to 120% of the deployment. But that's quite a big change if you've been looking at um, deployments and the regressions over the last year. Um, I'll come on a little bit more about uh, what well, that means in reality in a second. Um, so, a really important point to note, those reductions in tariff only apply for new applications. They don't, they're not retrospective, they don't apply to people that have already had um, systems accredited. Um, the other thing to note, uh, yeah, is that um, the reduction in the tariff, so the digression itself, kicks in one month later than the announcement. So every three months there's a review, if there is a digression, it'll kick in one month later. Could I, sorry, can I just ask, if yeah. you, what's the um, state of play with applications going in? Um, obviously, it can take them four to six weeks to, to get them back to you. Yeah. And at that point, you may get a, a neg some negative feedback and you might want some uh, adjustments made to the application. Yeah. What's, what, are you, what situation are you then in as an applicant in terms of the, the, the tariffs that you will see? Um, I'm not going to have a very satisfactory answer for you, unfortunately, because... The response from Ofgen is it's case by case. So if you submit a broadly complete and correct application, which is how they word it, so i.e. all your evidence is there and broadly correct, they just maybe maybe they can't read a bit of something you've scanned or something like that, so they come back to you. But broadly the application is complete. Um, the overall story is kind of that they're, they're happy with, they're happy that you're eligible. They may well then take that date that you applied. As your, um, as your sort of initial entry into the scheme. So if there's then a digression before you've actually had your um, thing accredited, they may well then take your data of accreditation back to the, to the point at which you put in your broadly correct application. However, if it was to land on a different off-gen person's desk, 
they may say, well, no, actually, you know, I had to go back to him for two or three things. So actually, the date that the actual correct application that I can sign off, that's the date. Um, so there isn't really a hard and fast rule. It, it will depend on, on how solid your application is. Um, and it may be that something that you can go back to Ofgem and argue that I, you know, all, all you asked me to do was clarify one tiny thing. You know, you're saying that my, uh, my application date has been moved on by six weeks and I've lost out because of a digression. So um, ultimately, we, we don't know how that's going to pan out yet, but it, it comes down to each case officer, unfortunately. Tim, can I just ask one thing? Back on the 150%, is, so that's currently still for the whole budget, the whole. Um, uh, RHI over uh, spend for the year. So if, if it doesn't increase above 165 of the budget, then these figures won't happen on the individual system. So the overall the overall RHI trigger yeah. is only 50%, not 100%. Oh, 50%. Yeah. Okay. So they want to be making sure that at least half of the RHI is actually being given out the door to people before they start looking at digressing anything at all because you know, to to put a digression on a on small small biomass boilers that are going great guns, when the overall RHI budget is only at twenty percent, would would seem <coughs> a bit ridiculous. So they they've chosen fifty percent as a as a good benchmark by which to then start looking at individual digression triggers. Um, <clears throat> so, so solar thermal, um, biogas and deep geothermal uh, are different in that they don't have. Um, their own individual deployment digression trigger. They are actually sort of related back to the overall RHI budget. So if each of, um, uh, if each of them uh, go above 2.5% of the overall RHI budget, then um, that's when you would be looking at the digression for them. So very similar, but they don't have their own individual triggers. They're related back to the main RHI trigger. Uh, okay, so yeah, the point of the digression, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting with my discussions back with industry about how people find digressions. I think a lot of businesses just just crack on with it and aren't really that fussed about analysing the figures to understand are we in line for a 5% digression on small biomass or not. Um, you know, ultimately, is that going to be uh, balanced out by an increase in RPI later on in the year? So, does it really matter that much? And then other businesses are sort of absolutely no, we want to know exactly what any one of our customers is likely to be receiving in six months' time. So a very kind of odd situation at the moment. Um, but ultimately the point of the digressions is, is to meet both of those demands. So one is to protect the budget, that's what they're there for. But the second one is to also uh, get across this idea that there is very unlikely or there isn't going to be any snap reviews changing everything. This is to sort of help investor confidence to say, yeah, of course we have to reduce the tariffs at some point if something's over deploying, but this is how it works, you can see for yourself. So the idea is that it's all about investor confidence. Okay, so I've included the link about where DEC actually released their monthly statistics. Annoyingly, DEC sort of, when, when this was in the consultation, they were proposing digressions, DEC was saying, yeah, we'll definitely release statistics in a way that's easy for industry to clearly see what deployment is. Yeah, not so much. Um, typically, they, they are within a month, but they're right at the back end of, of the month they can release them. So you very you don't really get much of a sense of forewarning with them. So yeah, they, they've done it to the letter of the law, but unfortunately, it's not it's not quite good enough to use it as a predictive tool. I would suggest um, so they they release statistics every month, regression every three months. If there is a regression, then there's one month's notice. And as I said, they they aren't retrospective. Uh, and it's the date of the accreditation, so the, the, the date which the, they actually put is the accreditation date that will dictate, dictate what tariff you get. So not commissioning date, not installation date, it's accreditation date. Um, the domestic RHI obviously will have its own triggers too. Um, so they're unrelated to the triggers that I've been talking about just now. Um, and we'll find out more about those in due course. Everyone still awake? Just picture that. Okay, not much laughing, so I'm guessing not many people are actually laughing. Okay, coffee time in 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> okay, so just, uh, we've already had some digression gateways, I call them, I don't think anyone else calls them that, but um, because you may or may not get a digression, it seems like a good description from my point of view. So we've had, um, we've had three already. So the first one was back in June 2013, uh, there was no digression. 
Um, in uh, September 2013, there was over 50% percent deployment of the RHI budget in total, and there was an over-deployment uh, of medium biomass, which over, I think, deployed 151%. Um, and so there was a regression, a 5% regression for medium biomass that kicked in uh, in October. In December, again, we just squeaked under the 50% um, uh, the deployment, so there was no regression there. And in March, uh, there will be another uh, regression assessment this year. Uh, any regressions that come in will be enacted, be enacted from April 1st. Um, and as I said, they will be under the new rules of 120% trigger level for uh, biomass, and, uh, and the rest will remain at 150%. But the budgets themselves have been reallocated to the different technologies. Now, this, is, this is actually uh, if you're involved in biomass, good news. <laughs> so, um, DEC have been reasonably sensitive about this and gone, okay, 94% of applications are going to biomass. We kind of get that there's a bit of a trend here that renewable heat is, is going really well for biomass. Overall, the RHI isn't deploying as well as we should, it, it should be. So, we can either uh, try and sort of retard biomass a little bit to try and encourage the other technologies. Or we can just accept that biomass is doing quite well and then see what we can do about the other technologies to encourage them. And they've done, uh, they've done the latter, which is good. Um, so, this is probably a uh, better slide. So beforehand, each technology had its own budget, its own annual budget, which is where those triggers came from. So last year, uh, or rather the uh, profiled amount for 2015, for small biomass was 29.4 million. So if that exceeded its expenditure by 150% at the time, then we'd um, have had a depression. They've now doubled that to 63 million. So although they've reduced the sensitivity of the trigger, i.e. if you get a little bit of over-deployment, you're going to get a depression, the actual pot of money has, has gone up considerably for buyers. So that should mean um, it's supporting rollout of, of certainly smaller and medium biomass a lot more, but if they do over-deploy, they get penalised much faster. Excuse me. So that's, that's the way they've kind of dealt with that. More sensitive trigger, but there's more money in the pot. So overall, um, biomass um, has, has gained from this. Um, there's been other uh, technology reprofiling as well. So where, um, uh, where you've had things like solar thermal that haven't been deploying well at all, they've reduced the budget for that. There's no point in having budget in a technology which isn't deploying because you just have to hand it back to Treasury at the end of the year. So they look to really reprofile that as much as they can. Um, that's just a outline in that. Um, so the difference is obviously um, quite marked. Um, really good news for small and medium biomass, um, and sort of uh, not so good much good news for large biomass. Solar thermal heat pumps and biomethane that have all had their individual technology budgets reduced by a certain amount. Mm. Um, but again, that's purely down to perhaps they were profiled poorly in the first place. So there isn't really the deployment to justify having that, that budget associated with them. Okay, so I've really rattled through that quite quickly. Um, I'll over the, well, from 11 o'clock onwards, I'll really be starting to get into the nuts and bolts. So that was just a general. This is what the RHI is designed to do, this is the problem it's there to fix. And this is why the money behind it is so important. A, there is money until 2015, 2016. Um, B, there is an intention for there to be money until 2021 for new, for new applications. But ultimately, the digressions are there to kind of stop any more meddling. What we have now, including sort of the results of the review that happened last year, should be a stable renewable, renewable heat incentive right up until 2021. So that is there to give uh, total investor confidence. Um, I'm sort of a little bit early, about 10 minutes early. So has anyone got any kind of questions that I can go through whilst they're just um, finishing off the coffee stuff? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, I'll ask Dan to put the front first. Yeah. First of all, no, I'm not objecting. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> many years. Uh, are these uh, conditions applicable in other areas of the country? We're sort of pretty much nationwide, and then we uh, have uh, lots of customers elsewhere. 
uh, the Midlands, and uh, are these conditions applicable everywhere in the country? So everything I've talked about this morning, yeah. other than the sort of renewable energy generation in the South West, all of that was, was national. Okay, thank you. So across the piece for renewable heat. Thank you. Um, sorry, yeah, there was one here. I'll work my way back through the room if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is there any uh, evidence that there is some joined up thinking in government, and that doesn't happen often, um, with regards to the zero carbon targets for new build and the allowable solutions that they're talking about for uh, the renewable elements of that zero carbon build, and any of what you've described today in terms of the renewable heat incentives? So, Joined up thinking, yes, in a sense that the departments are kind of aware of what the purposes of all these different incentives are. Um, connected thinking in terms of bolting them together in a, ver in a very kind of seamless way, probably not so much. So um, new build, and I'll, I'll come on to this later on, new build is excluded from renewable heat incentives. However, um, the government's sort of real um, pet deliverable at the moment is district heating, so that is being really uh, encouraged uh, from very small developments all the way up to kind of new town planning sort of point of view. The difficulty is then obviously for a local authority to try and weigh in and, and really get behind that too, rather than allowing developers to dictate allowable solutions or off-site solutions from a target's point of view. So we're kind of in this odd situation where individual local authorities perhaps um, aren't target driven from energy and renewables as perhaps they have been in, in more recent years. The government is still very much behind it, and including kind of more innovative ways of, of um, reducing energy demand. Obviously, the regs are pushing it in a certain direction, but in terms of renewable heat incentive, no, the um, new builds are ineligible. There's one bit further back, yeah. Um, we didn't get asked by um, our clients, what's the contract? I can't see the contract. Of course, it is no contract because it's, it's legislation. I mean, what's, I mean, it's unlikely the government are going to pull it, but is there anything actually written down, say, because yeah, it's obviously going to the Energy Act, mm. that actually, you know, this is, going to, this is going to not disappear, it's not going to get, as you say, it's a large number of Treasury money, it's yeah. not been taken up, what's, say, the Treasury Army going to go, actually? Yeah, the, <clears throat> I think there's got kind of three-pronged response to that, really. One is, um, Treasury are broadly happy with renewable heat incentives, so they, they're aware that we have carbon targets we have to meet legally. That, that will cost us money one way or another. So they're fairly happy that renewable heat incentive um, is delivering good um, value for money in terms of carbon emissions reduction. So for one, Treasury are putting the same pressure on deck to kind of change things or, or on number 10, for instance, for instance, to kind of weigh in and get involved. And we saw that most recently with sort of David Cameron's little episode on um, you know, getting rid of green levies. Broadly, schemes that were supporting renewable energy were, were excluded from that. Um, so I think the, the kind of driver behind it um, is you, you sort of you need to understand um, is is coming from a safe place. Um, secondly, it would involve primary legislation change. So that's that's going through the entire parliamentary legal process in order to change anything to do with this by and large, which uh, is a pain. Parliamentary timetables are pretty tight, so it's unlikely that you would get a government now really wanting to to make any significant changes to this. So. Again, that kind of puts another kind of year or two on before people would want to start meddling with it. Um, and uh, there was a third one, which I've forgotten. Um, yeah, ultimately there is, a, there is a will behind this as well. So if you look back at the original impact assessments that were delivered as part of this, a big chunk of this was sort of saying, we need to be incentivising this and to be switching away from fossil fuels it's great for jobs, it's great for economy, it's great for CO2. So you're absolutely right, there isn't a, there isn't a cast iron guarantee that we're not going to get uh, you know, a, a, a very kind of extreme view from government that actually it's a complete waste of money, we're far better off um, investing in fracking or putting in another interconnect into Europe or something like that to deliver our CO2 targets. Ultimately, Treasury is happy that this isn't going to be knocking on the door demanding more money, because that's a big fear for them. Um, and they're happy that it's delivering good carbon savings. So I think the challenge for us as an industry is to actually get more uptake of RHI to really lean on those that it's, it's working, it's doing what you said, and we're happy that it's, it's value for money. 
But no, in, in real terms, other than primary legislation that would take time to do, there isn't there isn't any. I think there was one at the same level on this side. Yeah, there was one. It's more of the nitty gritty of the yep. <coughs> excuse me of the system um, on the non or the domestic RHI. Yep. Um, if we're doing huge properties, mm -hmm. the payments they get are based on the EPC, which is carried out, correct? Uh, they're based on the Green Deal assessment, yeah, yeah. Which, which involves an EPC, yeah, yeah. and that's ultimately what they get payment on. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll cover this shortly, but um, I mean, yeah, for purposes of this, okay, yeah. And um, is there a limit on that? For example, if you, if it was a domestic property, but it was a huge property, yeah. And the payments yearly might be quite, you know, might be five, ten thousand pounds. Is there a limit to these? So there's no, there's no limit on the money that an individual property can receive through the RHI. The limit is basically on the energy demand of that property. So assuming it's otherwise an eligible domestic property, yeah. um, it will have uh, an EPC, uh, which will be done through the Green Deal route, and that Green Deal will. Um, I'll chat about the details about the energy efficiency side of it in a second, but ultimately that Green Deal element of the EPC will show you what the energy demand for that property is over a year. That's all you will get paid for under the RHR. So if it said that this property needed 100,000 kilowatts of heat per annum, yeah. they'll get paid whatever the rate is, 12.8 mm -hmm. so, yeah. say, they would get that. Yeah, There's that, no, that's no limit on it. Yeah, that's what the Green Deal assessment said. <coughs> that's, what, that's what they get. But there are a couple of kind of complications to that that we'll, we'll cover after okay. the break. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Uh, who's further back? I'll go with you first, sorry. Yeah? I just think I just noticed that your timing um, went to break in before the domestic renewable heat intensity. Oh, yeah. They've got a massively overrun, not underrun. Oh dear. Okay. Um, was there any more questions then? Just, just yeah. quickly, possibly a little bit tricky to answer, but um, yeah. given the uh, increase in budget for small and medium biomass yeah. and your analysis of the cuts of that sector currently, are we likely to see a digression um, going forward in April? Uh, sticking my neck out, I would suggest not because of the increase in the budget and because of the, the blip we had with accreditations in uh, winter last year. Um, so you're absolutely right, I've actually uh, I've knocked off half an hour of my own talk, which is pretty appalling. Um, what I would suggest is if I do the first sort of 10 minutes of the domestic scheme now, have a sort of 20 minute break and pick it up afterwards. That seem good? Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so actually this, this um, uh, this should be a good opportunity really to take you through it and then, then have some questions. So these are, this is pretty much what we know about domestic RHI. Um, just to sort of qualify that, I suppose, so DEC have released their information about domestic RHI, which is, we want it to do this. Ofgem, who will be administering the domestic RHI, haven't yet released their guidelines. Now, it's their guidelines that are the nuts and bolts of how you would apply um, how you would uh, deal with any of the slightly different issues, how you deal with metering, all that kind of stuff. So those guidelines haven't yet been released. Um, but uh, we can go through what we do know about domestic RHR. So um, there's financial support on the domestic side, obviously. Uh, it's still planned to open in spring 2014, although to deck spring is any time from April through to June. Um, so it is uh, indelibly linked to the MCS scheme. So you have to have an MCS piece of equipment and an MCS installer in order to participate in the domestic scheme. Uh, and that means it has to be an under 45 kilowatt piece of plant. I'll go over that again in a, in a short while. The other thing is you must have had a Green Deal assessment. Um, <laughs> is that a Green Deal assessment? <laughs> uh, yeah, so you must, you must have had a Green Deal assessment. Um, again, I'll cover that in more detail in a second. Um, again, it's budgeted until 2016, as I said, because it comes out of the main RHI budget, um, but it's planned until 2021. <coughs> um, it's phased in quite a complex way that I haven't gone into this morning um, with renewable heat premium payment. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll go into that in a second, because there's a lot of confusion about RHPP and RHI and, and the, the two and how they meet. Um, it has its own system of digressions. 
Uh, like non-domestic RHIs in NextLinked, which is good news, there are minimum energy efficiency standards that go along with the domestic RHI. There aren't with the non-domestic RHI. So that's quite a key difference between the two schemes. Um, any installations that have had any public money uh, aren't eligible. It's not even just a case of paying back the money. If you've had any money to help pay for kit, you can't apply for this. And it is open to legacy installations, so anything that was commissioned, again, by an MCS installer and its MCS kit, anything that was put in and is still eligible um, after 2009 um, is eligible to apply. And it's a seven-year tariff. Um, the blue bit at the bottom is quite an important sort of differential, I suppose, between non-domestic and domestic. Um, it's basically a boiler replacement scheme. It's not intended to offer 12% internal rate of return like the non-domestic scheme was. This is mainly aimed and basically between just replacing your boiler with the same and replacing it with a renewable energy generation device. That's what it's intended to do, and I think you sort of see how that impacts on some of the um, calculations in the second. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, limited to um, like regeneration under 45 kilowatts. Yeah, and if it goes over, it's tough. Or you can. Uh, put in a 45 kilowatt boiler and keep an existing or existing oil backup boiler. But you cannot put in more than 45 kilowatts. There is talk of the MCS scheme being increased to boiler sizes of up to 100 kilowatts, isn't there? So yes, there is. So, yeah, there is that talk. then be included? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll come Sorry. on. Sorry, right, that's good. Um, so the point of, of the uh, domestic RHI, as opposed to the non domestic, is this. Um, to, to have renewable heat in 750,000 homes by 2020. That's, that's the aim of the domestic RHI. Um, so one of the sort of main questions, and I, I didn't cover this in my last talk, and actually it sort of stimulated about 15 minutes worth of questions, was who can actually apply to the domestic RHI? Owner-occupiers, yes. Private landlords, yes, they can apply too. And DEC says ideally with the permission of the tenant, but apparently not necessarily so. Uh, a registered provider can apply if it's on an individual property basis, and a self-builder can apply to the domestic renewable heat incentive. Also, um, third party owners of the heating system can apply, so it's, it's going pretty well so far. Buildings um, with renewable heat installed from new can't, unless you're a self-builder. Yeah. You said about self-builders. Yeah. You earlier said that um, new builders exempt. Yeah. Is that, Is that an exception? Well, as in, so a building, well, so self-build is a very particular um, uh, type of new build in terms of the uh, legal status that's applied to it. So you would have to prove that it's your property for your residential use that, that you're building. Um, again, when the off-gen guidelines come out, there will probably a time, be a time limit associated with how long you have to be living in your property as a self-builder before you can sell it um, and still reclaim still claim the, um, the revenue. That's partly why the tariff is down at seven years, incidentally, not 20. Um, so, yeah, I think... Tim, they, sorry, Tim, can I just clarify that, because that is a common misconception. New build being developers, Jasim and Barrett, Bellway, they are new build, not self build. But that is still a misconception in the industry. If you do self build shows, Mr and Mrs Jones come up and say, I'm building a new build, a lot of people are telling them they don't qualify. Obviously they do, because they're self built They just don't understand the, the, the jargon, yeah, so it's yeah, important to yeah. identify that. Absolutely. There is a bit of a semantics issue, and I'm imagining that the guidelines themselves will, will clarify that. If they don't, Ofgen will soon realise that they need to actually produce some kind of clarification on that. Because you're right, it is a bit of a grey area, depending on what a business or an individual calls themselves. But ultimately, that's, that's the stipulation on domestic RHI as we, as we see it. Um, uh, and as I've said, the legacy installations themselves until the day that the scheme is actually launched, any installation that's already gone in will be exempt from the air quality uh, criteria that any application that will be going in after the scheme is launched will have to meet. So um, there's been a lot of sort of confusion over to whether or not people can put in systems now that they don't quite meet the emission standards so are going to be rejected. For domestic, um, the system can go in now and not worry about the emissions um, these sort of additional emissions criteria that Ofgen are imposing right up until the date at which the, the scheme is launched. Um, okay, I suggest we'll stop there for a quick coffee break before I start my quiz.
Uh, so, uh, yeah, if we can uh, be sat back down probably at 11 o'clock. Um, yeah, sorry, this is
Um, biomass boilers in particular are a slightly um, complicated one. So biomass boilers are eligible, that's the first thing. Um, provided they are only limited to solid non-fossil fuel biomass fuel. Um, so at times you can get uh, dual fuel um, boilers, uh, which could perceivably uh, run on coal as well as a, a, a biomass fuel. Off-gen are more than likely to reject those even if they are covered by MCS because you could potentially put fossil fuel in them and off-gen really don't want to be subsidising anyone that is actually burning fossil fuel. So something to be aware of there. Stoves, so the difference between a, a stove and a boiler is obviously a stove is a big thing, typically in the room that you want to heat, and it kicks heat out as well as um, possibly heating the water coil behind it using a back boiler. So stoves are definitely not eligible on their own. Stoves with a back boiler are eligible if they're biomass pellet stoves. No other type of stove is eligible. Um, the uh, other issue whilst we're on that, I suppose, is biomass log boilers, so they're not, they're not stoves with that boiler, they're a log boiler, um, are struggling to meet the emissions certificates for domestic RHI. So just some things to be aware of, particularly around biomass when looking at domestic RHI. Um, as you can see, the rates are very different to the rates that you get from the non-domestic scheme. Um, so the significance of the seven years value, given the non-domestic is 20 years, um, DEC had quite a big wrangle over how long you provide support for, for a domestic property. The thinking behind seven years is that, is that it's long enough for someone to invest and continue using renewable um, fuels or renewable heat generations without just switching back to oil um, as and when oil prices, if they ever drop, or because they just um, you know, decide that they want to go back to, to the original fossil fuel. So it's long enough to kind of stop that switch back, but it's not so long that people are hanging around waiting for payback over 20 years or you know whatever. You're unlikely to invest in a piece of equipment that takes 20 years to pay back in a domestic house. Not many people move into a property um, sort of expecting to live there for 20 years in this day and age. Certainly not the 750,000 households that this is looking to support. Um, so that's the significance of seven years. They felt that was about right to offer the incentives. The reason why those figures are the figures they are is because they've squashed 20 years worth of support at a domestic level into seven years. So that's why the figures are, are different to what they originally proposed uh, years ago when this was originally being considered. Um, okay, so there's been quite a few questions this morning about how Green Deal assessments, how energy efficiency and how EPCs feed into the domestic renewable heat incentive. Um, so going back to that first statement, um, you have to have a Green Deal assessment to uh, be eligible for domestic renewable heat incentive. Have to, in that you have to upload the thing as part of the application, so you have to have had one done at that property. Unless it's a self-build, I think. Unless <laughs> See my slide uh, Unless it's a self-build, yes, but I shall come on to that. Um, so, there's a particular bit of the <coughs> assessment which is absolutely crucial for domestic RHI. Domestic RHI does not typically use meters to measure the heat that's being um, generated and used by that demand, i.e. by that property. It's done on a dealing basis. So, for any given property, you need a figure for how much heat you expect that property to need to, to operate at um, the standard level. Um, that is done through this process, through the EPC process. Um, so you have to have a Green Deal assessment in order to uh, give you the energy performance certificate, which gives you the kilowatt hours of energy with demand for that property. So that's hot water and it's space heating. Now, the key thing about having a Green Deal assessment, as opposed to just having a standard EPC done, is that for every property, the whole point of the Green Deal uh, process was, was to have an opportunity for that property to have its energy efficiency assessed and some suggestions for what you could do to that property to improve its energy efficiency and lower your bills. So I don't know if I've made it bigger, no I haven't. So you can probably just see there's a blue box uh, down here. Um, these two figures here, space heating kilowatt hours per year, water heating kilowatt hours per year, that's the existing dwelling heat demand as calculated by RDSAP. So that's what RDSAP says, 
your property will need in order to, to meet the heating standards. So the Green Deal then weighs in by saying, ah, but that, you haven't had any loft and cavity insulation done. So if a property has an unlagged loft and has an empty wall cavity, the Green Deal part of the assessment will say, well, you're eligible to have Green Deal finance for those two measures. If that's the case, you have to have those two measures done before you can access domestic renewable heat centre support. It only applies to those two measures, it doesn't apply to solid wall, draft exclusion, or any of the other measures that are included under the Green Deal. It does apply to loft and cavity. Um, which raises an interesting point, basically, that as a renewable heat industry, you're really going to have to know your links to A, the Green Deal assessment side of things, and providers of loft and cavity wall insulation, because any property that you go into of a customer that says, I'd really like a biomass boiler, they have to have their Green Deal assessment done. Once it's done, it may well say, you need your cavity and, and, and loft filled. Um, you will have to have those done in order to claim the domestic iron chart. Uh, the link is actually even stronger than that, in that you will only get paid under domestic RHI for, well, I'm going to do what I said I wasn't going to do now, and walk around. Um, so this is the existing dwelling heat demand. It's now got impact of loft insulation, impact of wall cavity insulation. By putting those two in, that obviously reduces your kilowatt hours demand, which is the figures in the two brackets, so that reduces your overall um, heat demand. That, that <coughs> reduced figure is what you can get your domestic renewable heat payments on, not the existing dwelling. So basically what, um, what the government is saying is, well, we've created a green deal, so you can go ahead, have your assessment, it says you have loft and cavity insulation, don't worry, it won't cost you anything to actually do those because you can get it financed, well, it won't cost you anything up front to do those because you can have it financed under Green Deal. Because you can have that done, we're only going to give you domestic heat payments on what your demand is after that work is done. So that's a really, really important point, that your Green Deal assessment is what dictates how much money you're going to get out of the renewable heat incentive and it will only uh, give you a figure after basic loft and cavity measures have been done. Yeah? Um, it'll be based on whatever is uh, in the governance of RDSAP, which I don't, I don't pretend to know the detail of how it's calculated. I do know, and there's some, it's a conversation I'm perhaps not willing to <laughs> embark upon right now, but the um, vagaries and difficulties associated with um, SAP as a method of assessing a property's heat demand. Um, that's a whole other event, I think. But from the RHI's point of view, this is, domestic RHI's point of view, this is yeah, absolutely necessary. So, um, so, yeah, really, really important point. Um, just work through a quick example. So, um, this um, EPC that I just grabbed off the internet it suggested that there was a 22,000 kilowatt heating demand for the property. Um, it would benefit from loft and cavity, which would take it down to 19 kilowatt hours um, after that work is done. Um, so that's what you would get your, um, your tariff based upon. So if you were looking at biomass, 12.2 pence per kilowatt hour, um, that would give you an annual income of £2,346. So over the seven years, that's about 16 and a half grand you would earn out of the domestic market charge. I think you include the water in that. Um, I, I, did for this one because I was assuming it was a biomass boiler that was doing space heating and hot water. Yeah. But, um, I think the again the key thing to recognise here is um, that's a fairly generous um, uh, heating allowance. It still isn't giving huge returns over seven years. I mean, it's great, sixteen and a half grand. That will probably offset the um, expense of replacing a boiler with a renewable heat generating boiler and offset some of the fuel costs. Um, over the years, and that's sort of not even taking into account the fact that oil is likely to increase at a far higher price than biomass fuel. But I think it is worth again underlining the difference between domestic and non domestic renewable heat incentives in terms of what they're aiming to do and what people get out of them. Yeah? Those figures you have there, um, does the payment not take into consideration the efficiency of the heat emitters as well? Um, no, because that's handled by MCS. So basically, they're, what they're saying is that you, you can choose whatever system you like to stick in. So you can choose a, a 20 grand MCS um, boiler if you like, or you can choose a very efficient 
hundred thousand pound um, order, if you like. We don't care. We're only going to pay you based on what that property's demand is. So um, they kind of sidestepped the issue of, of worrying too much about efficiencies and getting into the kind of um, actual system dynamics itself. Plus, they're backed up a little bit by saying, well, that, that's up to MCS, because everything has to be done through MCS for the best of car HI. You know, if we see that um, you know, there's very poor equipment coming through MCS that's very low efficiency and proving really bad value, then we can hit MCS with a bit of a stick. But you know, that, that doesn't come down to this level. So yeah. I was going to say that the point about the Green Deal bit that people don't have to go to the Green Deal to find that's a lot from charity. They can pay for it themselves. And also, just for interest, I don't know if you're coming on to your own slides, but how do you prove that the loss in cabinet has been done before you apply to the RHI? Yeah, um, good question. We don't know the answer to that. Yet. So that, again, is something that will come out in the off-gem regulations. About, and there is a real sensitivity about the order in which you do this. So, Say I was aware that um, I didn't have any loft or, or cavity insulation, but I really, really wanted my biomass boiler. Could I not just put my biomass boiler in, then get my green deal assessment? How would that affect the viability of loft and cavity under green deal? It probably wouldn't affect it that much in that instance, but there is a sensitivity about the order in which things are done. Um, and he's absolutely right, though. All off general are interested in, and they're going to be the, the people sort of handling the applications for this, is they have a list, a long list of tick boxes. They want to see your green deal assessment. They want to see that um, they want to see what your heat demand is after those two measures are done, or that those two measures aren't appropriate for whatever reason. That that's it as far as they're concerned. They're only going to be paying you based on that heat demand. There, there may be a case for you don't even necessarily um, have to have to go through with doing the, the actual work itself. Um, Cavity, cavity wall may be exempt because of of the it's been in the southwest uh, because of uh, eye exposure. Yeah. So again, this comes back to the person doing the assessment often as to whether or not there are any reasons. Maybe it's a hard to treat narrow cavity. There may be a number of reasons why doing those two measures won't be possible. But the, the main message really for you guys is that loft and cavity are inex inextricably linked to. Um, the renewable heat incentive, as is the green <coughs> assessment, so absolutely um, key thing there. Um, and yeah, the, the costs do sort of broaden out, but we're not talking um, sort of non-domestic levels of 12% return. Is there another question about that? There? Sorry, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, is the, uh, the RHI payment subject to income tax, and what happens if the household and moves within that seven year period? Um, so, if the household moves, I'll take the second one first. If the household moves, they're basically selling, um, they're selling the system and they're selling the house. So, it's the, they're basically selling ownership of that to a new person. So, it's the new person that would receive the payments. So, that's that. Um, your first question, which was asking, sorry, remind me again? Um, income tax. Income tax. Um, as far as I'm aware, and this gets extremely thorny when I try and uh, tease the elements of this, for domestic, um, this isn't uh, attributable to income tax, so you don't have to start doing self-assessment returns just because you're getting involved in domestic RHI. Um, it is a little bit more complex for non-domestic RHI, I have to admit, but um, in general, uh, you're not, you're not um, eligible for income tax. <coughs> So, just going back to one of the previous questions, can you not do it on an EPC and a Charter Surveyors report? No. So, the point was raised earlier on, I think I'll cover it in a second though, but self-builders, so they're the unusual case in that they're already building a brand new property, but it's for current regs. So, the government will see that that is sufficient, there's no point in doing a Green Deal assessment because there's no improvements to make, you're already making it to, to um, the latest regulations. So in that case, you can just submit an EPC. That gives you what the energy demand of the property is. That's fine. But that's that's where being very aware of what the status of, of that build is has to be self-built. For everything else, you have to have a green deal assessment lodged. Okay. Uh, moving on. So, uh, yeah, a question that I got asked last time uh, was. Um, is there a difference between the solar thermal side of things 
um, because obviously solar, solar thermal typically isn't providing all of the heat to a system, it's a contributor to. So solar thermal is different in that it takes its, um, its uh, kilowatt hours that you're going to be paid for off the MCS certificate that it was installed with, not the Green Deal assessment. You still have to have a Green Deal assessment done, but the number which you will calculate the return on will be on the MCS certificate, not on the um, not the Green Deal. Do you have to have the installation done for solar thermal? Um, well, if, yeah. If the Green Deal assessment says you have to have it done, i.e., their green tick, you have to have it. You have to have it done. Um, Even if you're keeping with a fossil fuel fuel boiler for the heating. <coughs> uh, well, if you want to claim RHI support, then yes. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of gateway really to act to support. Um, so obviously we have um, we have the renewable heat premium payment scheme, which is still in effect until the 31st of March this year. Um, 24,000 vouchers have been issued, which is pretty good. Broadly, um, it's a lot sort of more fair across the technologies than the non-domestic renewable heat incentive has been. Um, air source heat pumps, unsurprisingly, are doing pretty well, as is solar thermal. So um, a much greater range of technologies seem to be. Um, being supported under domestic installations rather than non-domestic. Um, and Southwest is doing pretty well in terms of all of those over the whole country, which is good to see, good proportion of those. So some of the first questions that people ask is, okay, so now I understand that it has to be MCS, so therefore at the moment it has to be under 45 kilowatts, um, so can I have greater than 45 kilowatt system put in? The answer is no. Um, you can't. So for domestic properties that perhaps have a 60 kilowatt um, demand, um, either they have to put in a 45 kilowatt um, uh, generation and then make up the rest in fossil fuels or some other way, uh, or they just they just can't get any support at all. So it, it is limited to 45 kilowatts. The, the reasoning behind that, and it's perhaps a little bit more strained down here than in other areas of the country, is that those 750,000 households that DEC is looking to support um, the vast majority of those are going to have a less than 45 kilowatt heating demand. So they're sort of saying, well, the extra complications of doing stuff outside of MCS, based upon how many people are actually likely to uptake it above 45 kilowatts, doesn't warrant it. So yeah, we know it's a pain for some people, we're just going to leave it as it is. So the government knows it's not a perfect solution, but in order to get the scheme off and running at all, that's what they decided. Um, so the next question is obviously, okay, what well, can I put in two 45 kilowatt boilers? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, the last question, can I put technology in, the second, in a second home? And the answer is yes, but you have to have it metered. Um, and that is obviously on top of also having a Green Deal assessment done. Um, so there are a few situations where meters will be involved in domestic. Second homes is one. The way a meter will feed into things is that uh, obviously you have a second home, you're using it perhaps. Uh, well, no, I don't know how often people use the second <laughs> home, but assuming it's kind of four weeks a year or something like that, obviously you'd be very keen to get the full <laughs> EPC kilowatt hours demand of that property in payment because no one's checking, it's just deemed. <clears throat> so, what Deck has said is well, if you have a second home, yes, you can put in a renewable heat source, but you have to have it metered. Um, and you're still limited to the amount that it says on your Green Deal assessment. So if you're metering, so you get you get whatever's lowest, basically. So if you don't use your full kilowatt hours over the year because you're not there very often, you'll get what the meter says. If you are there and you happen to use, um, your meter says you've used loads more than what the Green Deal assessment <coughs> property said, tough, you get what the Green Deal property assessment says. So that's just something to be aware of, um, particularly regarding second homes. Sorry. Yeah, who's first? Right. Okay. So in a situation where they've got a second home but they let it out as well as being a second home, and the, the Green Deal assessment would, uh, would would highlight that, <coughs> they get a higher... Uh, they let it out. So I think, again, that would come down to a case by case, what proportion of the year are they letting it out? So it would still be a domestic, to start with. Um, they would still have to have... Um, a meter installed yeah. because it's, it's registered as a second home. Yeah. Um, I think the rules would still apply. It's like, you know, as far as DEC's concerned, you're offsetting a fossil fuel with a renewable energy generation. The fact that someone's living there two days a year or 365 days a year doesn't bother them. They're still not going to pay any more than what the EPC 
says it needs. So I think it would probably be okay, but it would be one of those, you'd have to be quite careful with the, with the paperwork in, in terms of going back and forth often. Yeah, they want to see supporting evidence of that when they're with the agreements and that sort of thing. I yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll come, in, I'll, I'll come on, in, on some detail into um, the actual evidence that we provide this yeah. general thing shortly. Yeah, just, sorry, just to touch on that thing then, just to make it crystal clear, if you've got an above 45 demand, you stick a 45 kilowatt um, biomass in, for instance, and yeah. say you've got the, the extras made up of oil, so we're basically just metering the 45 and the rest is just made up. Uh, that's how they're going to deem the payments based on a metered 45 scheme, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's a very good point. So if you do end up putting in a 45 kilowatt system and having some additional fossil fuel uh, back up in the same property, which is perfectly eligible to do, and in some ways that would be the way of getting over the 45 kilowatt limit, you would then need your renewable heat generation metered, so you would need to pay for a meter to do that. But the same will apply, okay. which is, you know... If you just want to clarify that was all clear. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Just um, to possibly confuse it a little more, um, if you've got a MCS 45 kilowatt boiler uh, biomass and then you install a secondary 45 kilowatt MCS boiler, would you also have to meet uh, the one that you're applying on? Uh, if, they were the, if that was the sole, so what you're saying is that you, you do a 45 kilowatt boiler first renewable heat, you still have a fossil fuel, you then end up replacing that fossil fuel with um, an additional capacity in We'll heat. say you just got completely, you, you install a 45 kilowatt boiler because you want to get under that 45 kilowatt limit to receive the domestic RHI, and then, but you need a, a 90 kilowatt, you've got 90 kilowatt heat load to install the two boilers, even knowing you're only going to get funding on one, would you still then have to meet to the one that you're applying to the RHI? Uh, that's a very good question. I would say yes, because the way Ofgen would look at it is, You've gone through your gateway, you've got your one renewable energy generator. Oh, now you're telling me you've got other plant in there. No, we don't care if it's renewable heat or not. You've had your, you've had your kind of slice of funding. So, yes, in that respect, I suspect I would uh, ask you to meet to it. I'm um, just going to move on because I'm aware of time now. Um, so, I've kind of made this point uh, quite a bit, but the extra thing to add is that not all, not all bits of kit on the MCS website are eligible for RHI, so that's non-domestic or domestic. Um, a real pain, because you would expect, in an ideal world, uh, a consumer would understand that anything under 45 kilowatts, and again, that's both for, for domestic and non-domestic, you have to use MCS. Okay, great, I'll go to MCS and I'll select my um, piece of equipment that I want to use. Um, in an ideal world, that piece of equipment will automatically be eligible for RHI support. In reality, it's not. Um, the MCS database actually moves on at its, its own rate and has its own um, kind of back-end checks, obviously, and test certificates and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> the RHI is obviously moving on at a different pace regarding its regulatory timetable. So in particular, things like emissions on biomass boilers have meant that biomass boilers that maybe got on the MCS list two years ago now, they don't meet the additional emissions requirements set out by Ofgen. So, although they're still on the list, um, you could go all the way through the whole scheme, but then Ofgen might reject it because it doesn't meet the emission standards. So, what MCS and Ofgen are talking about is there's going to be another list, which, <laughs> which are eligible bits of kit that do <coughs> satisfy all of Ofgen's extra requirements. However, they can't agree who's going to do that list or where it's going to live. So it doesn't exist yet. So the main message really is if you've got um, customers or installations uh, that, are, uh, that you know exactly whether they meet the additional emission standards or not. Yeah. And this is for any plant that's going to be installed when this RHI goes live, not that it's already been installed. Well, th this is why I said um, for non-domestic and, and domestic, and this is, uh, yeah, this is kind of where events like this are good because it, it is... Very, very confusing otherwise. So, non-domestic RHI is already running. You still have to be MCS compliant for under 45 kilowatts, even if you're doing non-domestic system. For that, they have to meet the emission standards now. For domestic, if, you, if I was to go and install a biomass boiler now, um, I could pick anyone off the MCS list um, that, even if it didn't meet the current emission standards, um, I could install it now and then go through domestic RHI as a legacy and not have to meet the emission standards. Um, I'd obviously be taking a risk that I knew when the domestic RHI was going to come in and that I would get my um, 
uh, and then I would get it commissioned and signed off on the MCS side of things before that date. But in theory, that's, that's possible to do. So it's when, for domestic, it's when it's launched, that should be the date at which you then also have to meet these emissions. And, and it's not retrospective. And is there anywhere where those emissions are easily accessible from? So we know if we went to have, have a look at a boiler, yeah. we've got, we know what the emissions are, and we can compare that to what would be needed so we can be... Yeah, so another, another bit of the evidence that is absolutely crucial moving forward is a, an emissions certificate, which is done by a test house for each sort of uh, boiler model range, if you like. Um, so I'm assuming, maybe, maybe that's a foolish thing for me to do, but on the list of MCS and Ofgen compliant um, pieces of equipment, you would have that test certificate listed that you could access. Um, but if it was on that list, you would know that it was compliant anyway. Yeah. So all you can do up to that point is go, is if um, you or a consumer is sort of intent on a particular model, take a look at the model, contact the manufacturer, do you have an RHI uh, test certificate for emissions with this model? And say yes or no. <coughs> yeah, not a particularly straightforward or, um, or easy process, but you know, unless you're kind of regularly but using... They might not have an RHI test yet, yeah, they've already gone through MCS with that. that yeah. Make yeah. so. Or it, it may meet the standards anyway, it just doesn't have a test certificate yet. Either way, you would still have to encourage the manufacturer to provide one um, in order for that to be eligible. Can we assume the emission levels they set for in September are the same for domestic? Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I've covered this one. Um, so <laughs> broadly covered this as well. Again, the green lid assessment is there for two very good reasons. One is, is to actually check that you're not just sticking in a boiler, um, leaking heat out all over the place and soaking up some support. Uh, and of course, it, it generates the actual figure that you will be used to generate tariff. Of course, it's a, it's a great opportunity as well. If, if all of a sudden you've got 750,000 householders, hopefully, all of them having green deal assessment to their properties because they want to engage with renewable heat, well, that's a fantastic opportunity for them to line in the sand and know exactly what the energy efficiency of their property is, what other measures might be um, suitable under green deal. So hopefully this will stimulate more work in the energy efficiency arena uh, and more work sort of underpinned by the green deal assessment as opposed to being just another layer of bureaucracy that the <coughs> renewable heat sector is quite frankly doing a little bit Okay, this, this brings up the, the time yeah. that we were talking about at the break, and that is that if you are looking at an existing property, you're doing a, a, a GDA which is pre the installation of a biomass, it comes up with a figure, mm -hmm. and okay, the measures are taken into consideration, you get the measures done, and it comes up with the figure for the heating and the hot water. Mm -hmm. Now, we're working on the, um, the, the, the premise that we are dividing <coughs> that, that figure by 1314 and that will come up with a boiler size. Okay? So we're, we're looking at that measure. We then put the we then put the boiler in and it will change. So we, we've sized the boiler, we've told the customer that yes, under this GDA, <coughs> that's that's what you'll be paid for. So they're expecting X pounds for that. And then we actually do it, reassess it, and it changes. Could go up or could go down. And so, yeah, that's, we just have to cope with that. To a certain extent, yeah, and I think we will get more clarification about, it goes back to uh, what I was saying about the timing of the different elements of this process, because it is absolutely crucial. What the documents at the moment are saying is that, from Ofgem's point of view, once you've had the first Green Deal assessment done, and it's said that after you do those measures, your new heating demand will be X, that's, you know, and you have your EPC produced, they then don't want to see another EPC afterwards to prove that you've had the work done. They're happy that, oh, okay, so if you do have loft and cavity done, then your new heating demand will be X and you're putting in a, a, an air source heat pump to meet that fine. However, I suspect there will be um, clarification on that because, I, I, like you, it, say another EPC was to be done for another reason, if you know, property kind of gets sold from a social housing landlord or whatever, you're then going to end up with two different figures, and if Ofgem do an audit, they'll be then going, well, hang on, this EPC after the work was done is saying that you've got much lower heating demand than the one that was done before. So we're going to, you know, look at that. At the moment, we, we've got no idea how they're going to handle that, unfortunately. Um, as I've said, that'll be something that we'll be raising with them fairly strongly, because it's an absolutely crucial... Well, yes, because what Brendan was saying is that when you compare an oil boiler to a gas boiler, they're different. Yeah.
So, yeah, I mean, obviously you've got the inherent issues with, uh, with the SAP process, which you know, I'm sure many people in the room will be aware of. Um, the difficulty will be how much uh, knowledge Ofgen have of those difficulties and how they can marry that up to the debt regulations to produce guidelines for industry. So again, that's something that we kind of need your support to tell us what the issues are so that we can kind of fight that corner for you. But unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to that today. Right. Who, who's recommending that RD SAP is the basis for sizing a boiler? Uh, because that, that is the system we have in terms of EPCs. So they're not, they're not recommending, no, they're not recommending you size the boiler. All they're saying is that, well, the EPC that we trust as a way of assessing a property is telling us this, so we'll make payments based on that. You can actually put in whatever system you like. You should size the boiler on the size of the building, not, 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 yeah. not, not yeah. So it's up to the... It's just a rule of thumb. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not... Uh, yeah, I mean, you should size the rule. If you're sizing the boiler, you should size yes. it on it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it just gives you yeah. Yeah. around that. The occupancy assessment gives, gives the demand because obviously if you've got a three bedroom house with one person living in it, the, uh, the Green Deal occupancy assessment will lower the demand for that particular building. But if you've got six people living in there and they're having two baths a day each, that the demand will go up. So it's the demand on the Green, on the green Deal occupancy assessment, isn't it? No, because that house could be sold. You, you, you so size the yeah, but it's, it's a combination of the two though, isn't it? That's what the UPC is for. Yeah. 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 Just, just to kind of clarify that, it is the green. It is, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a chance in a second. It is the green. It is the green deal figures that they're using. It's not. It's not the EPC side of things. So it's, it's including that occupancy element. Um, yes, the building might be sold. That's again down to the seven years of well. We're banking that out. Seven hundred fifty thousand householders. You know, seventy percent will probably still be in the house after seven years. So they are trying to sidestep as many of these complicating issues as they can, which inevitably will cause on a case by case. Um, Will, will cause issues, and again, I'm afraid I don't have the kind of media answers for you because until we get guidelines from Ofgem, which fingers crossed should be coming out in the next eight weeks, then then we should have a better playing field. Sorry, yes, your question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, currently, under eco calculations for various measures, um, assessors can take the EPC <coughs> and generate pre and post EPRs, which will give you a reasonable calculation of carbon and energy uses, etc., projected forward. So, mm -hmm. in answer to the other question, I don't see that that couldn't be done to determine what the energy impact would be after the installation or whatever they were doing. Yeah, I think there's, there's many ways of doing the actual assessment. <coughs> the difficulty you have is that you've got a desk officer and option. When they get an application, they print it off, it lands on their desk, and they have tick boxes that does it have a really good assessment? Yes. So you're dealing with someone that, with a very, very process-driven system by necessity, because it's a very big scheme. So the flexibility there is to demonstrate things in different ways is going to be very, very limited. And that, that's going to be the problem in that we have a system that we have to work within and it isn't ideal at all however that, that is the system so we may be able to tweak certain things as, as we move forward with Ofgem and unfortunately that, that's the baseline and that's what we have. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, I'm aware that this could stimulate an <coughs> event all on its own um, and perhaps that's a good idea but I'll move on uh, yeah, I've kind of mentioned this already so um, the Green Deal provider, the Green Deal Assessor, the uh, Loft and Cavity and the other kind of energy efficiency measure uh, industry and sector is a really important one to understand, to get to know your uh, local supply chain who can do those measures as they, they will come up um, as part of um, moving forward in domestic renewable heat intensive. And obviously the, the programme based throughout the South West can, can help you do that. So by all means come and speak to us if, if that's um, something that you need some support with. Um, okay, so I've mentioned that in uh, quite a large amount of detail. Um, again, the difference for those of you that, that aren't aware of the difference between green and, and, and orange ticks is uh, a green tick is automatically satisfied by the golden rule, so the cost of the measure will be repaid by the savings in your energy bills by having that measure installed. So if, again, if loft and cavity get a green tick, then um, and you haven't had well, yeah, if they get a green tick, then you have to have them done, albeit you don't necessarily have to <coughs> be fine enough to do it. If they come up with a yellow tick, then it means they might um, satisfy the golden rule if the uh, if the property owner pumps in a little bit of cash themselves. So it's still a recommended measure, but it can't uh, satisfy the golden the golden rule as it stands. It's not fully eligible for green deal finance. What we're hearing from uh, green deal providers 
is that they're um, increasingly flexible on whether or not they use the golden rule or not. So again, just to be aware that there are these links to Green Deal, and Green Deal is very much a movable feast at the moment in terms of how the sector and the supply chain are dealing with it and the sorts of models coming forward. Um, but as installers, um, you will have to be aware of it. Sorry, can I clarify something? So, say you had a 100 mil um, loft insulation, yeah. then it might well come up with an orange tick. So, do you have to do that to the RHI? On orange the... ticks, no. no. Green ticks, yes. Um, so, we, we've mentioned this though. Um, self builders do not have to have green assessment because their property is, is brand new, but they will have to submit the EPC, which will be used um, for the uh, heat model. Okay, another, another quiz, because I really like them. Uh, so, log store with, uh, sorry, log stone with a back boiler. No. So, let's, let's take uh, non-domestic first. Non-domestic? Okay, let's, let's have a show of hands. For non-domestic scheme, do we think that's eligible? Show of hands. Um, okay, for the domestic scheme, hands up, who thinks it's eligible? Okay, who really isn't sure about either of them? <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, for the non-domestic scheme, it is eligible, provided the fuel emissions meet the requirements and you have a meter installed on the pipe work, so you're only measuring the heat that's going into the fluid. So, it is eligible for non-domestic. For domestic, it's not eligible because it's not a bio, it's not pellet driven. Uh, Does it have to be pellet or can it be some other form of... For domestic, it has to be pellet. Only pellet stoves are eligible. Only pellet, not yes. Right. Yes. However, biomass boilers, you can still obviously have the full range of biomass <coughs> fuel. That would be a boiler, not, not a stove with black boiler. So um, this is, I would imagine this is kind of going to be an increasing area of confusion because many people... Uh, naturally, you get quite confused with what is a boiler, what is a stove, what is a stove with a back boiler. Um, I'd like to engage with renewable heat and offset some of my um, gas bill by putting in a back boiler on my wood stove and kind of feeding a couple of radiators or my thermal store. A lot of people are going to be quite keen on doing those kind of things. Absolutely crucial that you're aware of where they sit with renewable heat incentives and, and both renewable heat incentives. Um, as I said, come and speak to us if you, if you want to have a question. Yeah. Say so, um, you wanted to put a, a biomass pellet boiler into a property and they've got an arger which is heating the hot water. Yeah. Are they still eligible for the RH? Yes. Even but they would have if it was an oil fired arger. Yeah. You'd have to you just have to meter the renewable energy generation. Oh, so even though it's just the hot water, you still have to meter it. Any generation, yeah, any generation that's contributing to the heat demand of that property. Um, you get one shot at it with domestic, basically, unless you're having solar thermal, which you can you can have that as a second technology if you wish. Um, but yes, you could have a you could have a when was it was sub 45 kilowatts biomass boiler <coughs> and you'd need a meter because you're keeping your existing fossil fuel demand. That would still be eligible. Or you can disconnect the disconnect the, uh, the water from the argon and let the pellet boiler do it. Okay, so yeah, that, that's another very interesting point in that for non-domestic RHI, Ofgem are very uh, focus on pipe work. So you could have a fossil fuel uh, boiler in the same shed or the same kind of commercial building as a biomass boiler. As long as they're not physically connected with pipe work, they would consider them as two completely different systems, completely different metering arrangement, etc. With domestic, and I'm, I'm still kind of trying to get clarification from this, it sounds like they're more focused on the overall envelope of the building and what's in it rather than what's connected with pipe work. So you may not even be able to get domestic RHI, or rather, just by disconnecting um, a particular piece of plant, doesn't mean you can't include it in the application. You still have to say, oh, we still have a heating system which is fed through an oil, oil boiler, and they would take that into account. So just because it's now not connected to the same heating system as the boiler, you would have to go through that. But again, that's one of, one of these other grey areas that's emerging that we're looking for clarification on. But yeah, difference between domestic and non-domestic. Non-domestic very much focused on the plant itself and the system it's connected to. Domestic, it's more looking at the envelope of the property. Um, I'm not doing it for time now. Yeah, kind of not too bad. It's still really long. Okay, so um, we've
we've already seen this slide once. Um, and overall, the RHI is, is underperforming. I've already mentioned that there's, a, there's been a series of fairly significant changes that were brought in. Uh, some were brought in in September last year, uh, and others were brought in uh, or going to come in later on this year. And after two years, 2014, 2015, we're going to start to make sure that commercial buildings have had some kind of energy efficiency uh, assessment, whether that's um, 3M or um, SAP or uh, there's all sorts of different ways depending on what kind of building it is. But we would like to introduce some energy efficiency. They dropped it. They're not doing energy, minimum energy efficiency at all for non-domestic. So uh, that's just another thing to be aware of, which is probably uh, a slight relief for the industry. Number three, tariff change. We've already covered this in um, a fair bit of detail. Um, the tariffs have been recalibrated to basically take into account that the vast bulk of it is going to biomass, which is doing really well. They're also keen to try to encourage those other technologies to come up with this. Trigger reprofiling, again, covered this in some length this morning. Um, so uh, it may make digressions more likely. Um, but we have to wait and see to see if that expanded pot of money that they've given to biomass is sufficient just to soak up the demand when there is. Uh, as I said, triggers are now more sensitive. So if we do uh, get close to our deployment levels, you're more likely to see a trigger than we have been in the past. Biomass sustainability. I'm going to cover this in some more detail in just a second. Okay, this is another fairly uh, important but under the radar change that was made. So previously, under the RHI, the uh, non-domestic RHI, plant couldn't be moved. So once you'd bought, and it had to be new, it had to be a new piece of generating plant, once you'd bought that piece of plant and installed it and connected it up to your um, heat demand, you then weren't really able to do anything with that particular piece of plant. You could replace it if it broke, you could potentially even upscale it and still continue to receive RHI, but you weren't able to ever move that piece of plant and take its RHI tariff and its duration with it. You now can. So you're able to move your piece of plant um, to either a different site that you own or a different place on your site, and it will retain the original tariff that it had, and it will also retain what's left of its 20 year duration. So that's quite a big change because now all of a sudden, if you're investing in a piece of kit, that <coughs> kit will now have additional asset value because it's got RHI rights attached to it. So that does mean that you could potentially. Um, sell it to a third party provider on your site and then they can move it to a different site so you could in theory have a second hand piece of RHI kit. Again I don't know whether there's going to be some tightening up on that because that's not something they're keen to support but as it stands at the moment you're allowed to sell them and you're allowed to relocate them so there's no real reason why you can't do that together in some form. So that's quite a big, that's quite a big change. Uh, the other big change again which was sort of slipped in under the radar is process heat can now be done outside. So for all the things we've been discussing this morning, um, the eligible heat demand had to be within a building. It had to be within a fully enclosed permanent structure for it to be classed as an eligible demand. From now, certain processes, certain um, heat processes, can be delivered outside and you can still claim RHI for them. So Ofgem give the examples, and they're kind of listed as examples as in we probably wouldn't let anything other than these two through. But you're allowed now to do drying processes, of which quite a few people are looking to obviously dry wood fuel because it needs to have a drying process done on it, so why not earn an RHI off that? Or commercial cleaning, so places like dairies that use a huge amount of hot water for cleaning down equipment, things like that, uh, potentially can now claim RHI for an outdoor, um, for an outdoor heat use. So that's a, a very big change and potentially of quite a bit of interest to, to different sectors. Uh, okay, this change has already been implemented, but there's, there's been a big change in the metering regime. Um, a lot of complaints from industry that the previous metering regime was pretty heavy-handed, a <coughs> huge amount of meters needed generally. Um, every piece of outdoor pipe work uh, needed to have meters both ends, to take account of the losses. Um, and this was generally seen as moving the bulk of all of the renewable heat applications into what was known at the time as complex. <laughs> So originally, uh, Ofgem's plan was, okay, well, we'll come up with two different kind of metering regimes and two different systems on how we actually go through applications. We'll have a standard one, which we expect most people to be in, and we'll have a complex one, which will deal with more complex things. 
As it happens, of course, hardly any projects end up falling into the standard uh, or the simple, or the simple um, batch. Most of them have additional demand, or they have additional generation, or they have ineligible demand, or they have a swimming pool, or they have outdoor pipe work. There's all, there tends to always be something which is causing a complication, putting it into the complex camp. So Ofgem have looked to readdress this, um, and in line with doing the metering as well. So this was the old system. Um, generation had to be metered, and typically demand had to be metered if you had a mix of eligible and ineligible demands. And there were to be no losses included whatsoever. So any losses in pipe work, any losses in um, buildings that weren't sort of used as a building could be classed as a kind of external cold space. It was all had to be accounted for and taken out. So you ended up with a system of often needing many meters to meet a, 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 what, what ought to be a fairly um, simple installation. Um, so Ofgem, using a very basic example, have now changed it so that as long as you're only metering the generation and some certain criteria on that outdoor pipe work or the losses are met, you can get away with just having a single meter. Um, obviously, obvious improvement. The, uh, as I've said, the generation only needs to meet it if there's no ineligible demand. So if you do have an ineligible demand on that uh, system, then you would obviously need to put in a, an extra meter to kind of take that out of your IHI payments. Now the losses in any pipe work that is external does still need to be accounted for, um, and I'll go into how that's done in a second. Um, <coughs> mainly, they've used this new tool, which is the heat loss calculation spreadsheet. Um, which I'll show you here. Um, the idea behind this is that Ofgem accepts that you have outdoor pipe work. Very often it will be uh, insulated up to industry standards. There shouldn't be a great deal of losses through underground heat main, in theory. Um, so therefore, let's not get too hung up about the losses that that introduces into the system and enforce loads of metering. The idea behind it really is that if you can prove that the system losses are less than 3% on your overall system, then um, you can disregard those losses and just include them in your RHI application. So you will actually receive RHI benefit, but up to 3% of losses on your system. Now the caveat here is it's provided all your pipe work is what's called properly insulated. Uh, properly insulated is reference to a couple of standards where, well, if you can prove that all your pipe work is insulated to standard X and standard Y, we'll consider that properly insulated. Therefore, you can just disregard your losses, your losses if you can show that they're less than 3%. Great, fantastic, that sounds fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, those two standards specifically exclude underground pipe work. So, as far as Hobgem is concerned, at the moment, any underground pipe work isn't eligible for this dis, um, disregard, disregardation? Disregard. <laughs> You're not able to disregard the losses in any underground pipe work um, under that particular caveat because you can't prove it's properly insulated because the standards uh, don't allow it and say it isn't. They are looking at this and they're looking at seeing whether they can use additional standards to actually include underground heat mains so that you can go down that route. It's kind of shot themselves in the foot to a certain extent because that was the whole point of this, was to make life easier for the installer. You just prove it's, it's an industry standard, properly insulated pipe, and away you go. You don't have to put in extra meters. So this has been a real hiccup in that process. Um, the point of 3% is basically that's below the accuracy um, of, of a heat meter. So they're saying, well, even if you put in those heat meters, they, they're only accurate to within 97%. So what's the point in forcing people to put lots of heat meters in when it's not actually gaining us or them? So we'll just, as long as you can prove it's less than 3%, we'll let you contain the losses. How you prove it's less than 3% is with this delightful spreadsheet, which is full of macros, uh, full of um, lots of interdependencies, and full of bugs. So I've done this a couple of times. It's quite a painful process. Um, the idea being, it's great, it's got a summary sheet on the front, you go through plugging all your information, um, details about all your pipe runs, uh, what the pipe insulation is, even down to the thermal conductivity of all the different bits of the pipe insulation, how long the pipe runs are, your bits of kit, fantastic. It's supposed to then give you an answer on the front sheet, pass or fail, as to whether or not it's under 3%. Um, when I did it, all I got was divide hash by 0. <coughs> so, um, 
yeah, not so good. They are working on more versions of the little tires and they are getting better. So they've now even included uh, a feed and return option for pipe work, which of course most underground heat main is combined feed and return and same insulation. Before, you had no way of specifying that, so you had to phone them up and say, can I put in two different lengths and then divide it by two, or put in 0.5 of my thermal, just a mess, a real mess. Um, so don't underestimate, if you're doing this uh, on behalf of people, what's involved in this kind of thing. I think that's my long-winded way of, of saying that. Um, the other important, uh, yeah, so I've kind of covered that. The other important element of this is obviously a, um, there's a 10 meter kind of rule as well. So in practice, it's better to keep any external pipe runs to under 10 meters, because over 10 meters, you have to start filling out a heat loss spreadsheet for them to prove what the losses are. Um, so, in, on one hand, you've got to hand it to off that they've tried to make things easier for the installer, tried to reduce the burden on metering, tried to um, stop heat losses being such a pain, and said, no, we accept, you can just include them. That's all fine from a design and install point of view. From the application point of view, it's actually made life pretty difficult, and would probably lead to a lot more to and fro. Um, so again, it's just being aware of exactly what's involved. <coughs> Uh, oh yeah. Um, so the other way around it, um, if you have an ineligible, ineligible uh, generation on your system and it's too overly burdensome to meter it, you can now use a proxy measurement for that. So rather than metering a backup fossil fuel boiler that you leave on the system, for example, you can use fuel to proxy it. But be aware, they will assume 100% efficiency of that boiler to try and uh, kind of level the playing field, so to speak. So you won't, get the f you won't get the heat generation of that particular piece of plant, you'll get the fuel input. Um, so yeah, just being aware that, that that's a potential pitfall there. Uh, okay, we've covered that. Um, so I've covered this really, the properly insulated. So the off general are well aware of this, because uh, I phone them up every week and tell them off about it. They are looking at this. I think it's going to be one of these quite long-winded uh, processes that may or may not ever come to a satisfactory con conclusion. Basically, it's specified in the regulations, so what's laid before Parliament, as to what standards are kind of referenced by this stuff. And that's quite long-winded uh, to, um, to alter. Uh, so we'll keep pushing and hopefully we'll, we'll get some changes on that, uh, but it may not be quick. Okay, yes, I've caught up! Can I just slow you down one second? Sorry. Um, the, the metering requirements have changed in, in other ways as well, uh, in that now you can monitor usage um, instead of just generation. So uh, it was explained to me just before Christmas um, by one of the uh, help uh, desk team at Ofgen that I could potentially, if you've got a district heating system with a plant room and then say two properties um, which are linked by external pipe work, that I could meter just the two properties for their usage. Yeah. Is that true? Because I've since spoken to other people uh, on the help desk at Ofgen who've told me that's not the case. That's and also, when you try and apply, try and go through an application process yeah. with that arrangement of meters, it doesn't, it doesn't work out because you still have to do uh, a heat loss assessment. No, it's true. Basically, but I want to get to the bit where you say about the a non-eligible use, or non uh, a non-eligible use of un external pipeline. Give you his answer no to that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're broadly right. So in the regulations, you can do it either way. So you can either me measure your generation, um, and, just, and just as long as all of it is either eligible generation or you've taken account of, of the losses in other ways, that's fine. You can do it the alternative way, and this is sort of fairly untested because it's, it's a very different change, where you can just meter the demand itself, um, and again, as long as there, are, there, there is only <coughs> energy generation on that demand, that should be absolutely fine. And then you would probably have to submit fuel proxy to kind of back up what you're saying about the fact that no, we're only using um, eligible generation, but we're measuring the demand. So yeah, I, um, I purposefully didn't put that in really, because sure. it's a bit more of a um, grey area, because often themselves really yeah. aren't clear on, on they're, how they're that really works. No, and, um, and because also if you go through that, that scenario, um, they still require um, an independent, independent meter report, um, which has to take into account all the external pipe runs, etc. Yeah. So it's still a very onerous um, application. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, just one question, moving it a little bit. You haven't spoke much about air to water heat pumps, mm -hmm. and that um, you know you, you take the electrical element out of that. Is there a fixed um, sort of COP payment? On that? So that's based on the on the seasonal performance factor. Um, again, I, there was only so much I could squeeze into today, but that, yeah, you're right. It, you will only be paid RHI on the eligible heat delivery bit of whatever it is. So for a heat pump, you do take into account the um, the uh, electric element, and that's that's managed by the seasonal performance factor um, and COP. Do, do, do debt say any heat pump, regardless of the manufacturer, is going to be two and a half or three to one the SPF, or is it down to each individual in this? Installation. Um, no, it's, it's, it's done on a, again, similar to the sort of test certificates for biomass. It's done on a, the manufacturer will issue a test certificate of this is what this particular unit will produce, and that's what you go on. So you don't have to test. Even though they change, even though that figure will change in different properties. Yeah, yeah, as it would for um, emissions typically as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've actually noticed that I'm not uh, on time at all. I'm a long way behind time. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to push on. Um, by the way, I'm kind of around uh, for a good while during lunch and afterwards, so if there is stuff that I'm not covering you want to speak to me about, by all means, come and find me or uh, contact me uh, at a later date or one of the members of the team. So apologies if I don't get through everything today. Um, okay, so we've talked quite a bit about emissions uh, and biomass. What we haven't really talked about is where you get that biomass from. So the biomass uh, technologies obviously are slightly different than they use a fuel, so you have to purchase a fuel. Up until now, you've been able to purchase your fuel or acquire your fuel from pretty much wherever you like, and you haven't had to tell off Joe about it. From autumn 2014, everyone, and this is retrospective, so anyone that's already put in a biomass system will now have to declare their, uh, where their biomass is from, and in all likelihood, have to purchase their uh, fuel from an approved list. So this is known as the approved suppliers list. Basically, it's Dex's way of managing to make sure that any biomass fuel that is used is produced sustainably. So we don't end up with, yes, we're using renewable heat, but the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we're using to actually create, process, transport all that biomass fuel is you know, ridiculous. We have no handle on it. This is their solution to that. So um, this, is, this, could, this could mean fairly bad news for um, you know, uh, people that are involved in forestry or perhaps have their own woodland and are kind of cutting down logs and then selling them. Anyone that wants to use those logs in a, an RHI supported system won't be able to unless they're on the approved supply of this. Yeah. What if you're using your logs from your own land? Okay, so logs from your own land are different because that's automatically specified as sustainable. So you, but what you wouldn't be able to do is sell those logs to anyone else. So you could use them yourself. Um, this is a, a, a quite... Uh, Grey area at the moment. Deck, um, I'll come back to you in a second. Deck are currently out to tender for an organisation to actually run this list. It's a uh, eight hundred thousand pound tender. If anyone is interested in running that, um, and that's to run the list to manage uh, the audits of the people that are supplying the fuel, um, and to, in all other sort of senses, be the go-to place for biomass fuel in the UK. So that list was due to be up and running by the spring. So we'll see if that happens, given that as far as I'm aware, no one's even been allocated with the task of developing the list. Um, we're still unsure as well about how that works with pellets, given that pellets are produced um, to particular standards. Uh, and if those pellets are produced to a particular standard, what's the issue with reselling those um, through retail or whatever? How does, how does that work? So uh, I know there's going to be a lot of questions about how a business might evidence a supply chain. How much does it cost to get on this list? Um, you know, what do you have to do? Is there a minimum amount of fuel that you have to be producing? How would me as a small woodland owner that sells bags of logs, what does it mean for me? We don't know. Bearing in mind this is going to be up and running and sort of shrined in, in, um, in regulation by the autumn and we don't know the answers to any of those questions yet. So um, one to definitely watch, but it, it is retrospective, so that's the main thing. This is for yeah. non-domestic, because I'm just thinking about people with everything. So the people that have bought solid log boilers, biomass, yeah. Yeah. you buy the trailer of logs from Ted down the road, yeah. 
Ted down the road is going to have to look at this very carefully. <laughs> yeah. Because they, they, have, they have to be able to, and again, we don't know what the declaration of that year on year is. Is it just the person who owns the boiler signing something online to say, I, I declare that I'm, I'm um, buying my fuel from someone off the list? Do they have to supply receipts? Do they have, you know, we just don't know what has these people have to supply. But, you know, this is a big change. And it, has to be retrospective on that it means that anyone that's already installed a boiler, yeah. under the scheme, will still have to comply. Oh, so it's very unusual for them to, to do that because this is seen as such a big element of the RHI, i.e., well, we, we need to be sure that you know where, what the greenhouse gas emissions that this incentive is actually um, kind of stimulating. You need to know that. The only way of knowing that is it, through something like this. Yeah, just quickly. What's there stopping on a domestic level someone buying them from Ted down the road and saying, yes, they're my own logs of what I would somewhere, that's what I do? Uh, well, it's well, that's a good question. But yeah. as, as part of declaring that you're self supplying, there's probably going to be an element of this which will ask you for a, uh, a map of your woodland, it will probably ask you for a map of your access roads. I don't know, I'm just going on what I know about Ofgem. They will, there won't be much room. To, to wiggle through that, they will, they will want to be sure. Tim, can I just very ask yeah. you, where should we be looking to get the, where's this information about where this is going to happen? That's a very good, <laughs> that's a very good question. Maybe <laughs> Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Ted's as good a bet as any, because I didn't learn that. Ted can put this out. Um, it's out to tender. Someone's going to have a very quick job of setting, up, setting this up, getting it populated, um, and getting awareness of it out there. So, by all means, stay in touch with us, because we'll obviously make sure that we're up to date with it. But at the moment, that's all the information we have on this topic. Um, okay, so as I've mentioned, not all MCX boilers satisfy the new emissions requirements, and I've been through how that affects RHI, non-domestic RHI, but not domestic RHI until the launch. Um, boilers that could use a fossil fuel are pretty much being rejected by Ofgem, even at the point at which someone's really excited um, confident that their biomass boiler is going to go through, got it off MCS, great, do the application, off general rejected. Because there's nothing in the warranty of that, or, or the manual of that boiler that says you can't use fossil fuel or coal. Because of that, off general say, well, you, we could be supporting you to just chuck coal on this, so we're not going to support you. So be really aware of that. And I've covered a bit about the stoves of that boiler. Um, so, all non domestic that have been installed since 24th of December, September whew, last year, now must comply with the new emission limits. So any, any uh, installations that have been done but not yet gone through the application system, they will have to just check that those bits of kit do satisfy the new emission limits. Um, as I've said, any installations that go in as legacy, up until the point which the scheme launch, won't have to comply with the emission limits. Any that go in after the launch date will. And this is the, um, those are the actual emission limits that have to be met. So that's what's being tested against on the test certificate. So I'm, I'm going to really kind of ramble through this now because um, it's a uh, really much. <coughs> okay, so applications are managed and credited by Ofgem. Um, they're not for RHPP, that's the Energy Saving Trust. But for non domestic and um, the forthcoming domestic, it will all be Ofgem and it's all 100% online. You can do it by post a bit if you want for domestic, apparently. We'd really rather you didn't. That's the message for Ofgem. So it is all 100% online. That actually brings quite a few issues where people um, who are doing applications themselves are saying, well, I've taken a photo of my heat meter. How do I, how do I get that online? It won't let me upload a JPEG. It's, it's things like that that actually Ofgem's help, help desks spend the bulk of their time doing. It's helping people prepare evidence to upload to their system. Uh, and there is a big long list of evidence that you need for non-domestic, and this isn't exhaustive. Basically, you do need uh, schematics showing, ideally, building boundaries, as well as the main bits of kit and the main pipelines. Now, I've drawn schematics in Paint before, Microsoft Paint, and submitted them because the schematic of the, because for whatever reason, you know, the installers weren't uh, able to do it anymore, and their schematics weren't as built. So, all Ofgem are interested in is where are those bits of kit in relation to the building boundaries? So do they match up with where you're telling us the heat meters are, etc.? So um, yeah, it's quite easy to get hung up on schematics, but actually they're not after every single valve um, and every single condensate line. Um, you need your MCS commissioning certificate if you're under uh, 45, kil uh, 45 kilowatts. 
you need your admission certificate if you're a vitamin school owner, you need a letter of authority. Um, bear in mind this is all just for non-domestic at the moment because none of us know what the evidence we're going to need for domestic is um, exhaustively. The letter of authority, interestingly, is very often a typical farmer writing a letter authorising himself to apply for the RHI and signing it. That's all they need. Um, the heat generator manual, you need to upload that because they use that to, to determine what fuels you're allowed to use and what fuels you're not. So check the manual very carefully in the biomass boiler. You, you really want it to be saying only use you know, wood pellet or only use um, you know, solid biomass fuels. That, that's what they're looking for. Um, which obviously includes uh, the fuel specification. Photographs, take photographs of everything. As I mentioned, the actual application drops onto the case officer's desk in Ofgem and they flip through it. The more pictures they have of your system and the eligible demand, the more of a feeling that they have that you've got an eligible system here. Um, so, yeah, when you're doing installation or if you're sort of applying on behalf of other people, or whatever, photographs are absolutely key. Heat loss spreadsheet now required if needed. Uh, ideally, some photographs or uh, the manual of the, um, the thermal conductivity and the insulation of the pipe work. Uh, this is a really uh, crucial one, is uh, ideally Ofgen want to see some kind of paper evidence of, of what you're actually heating. So if you're heating two properties under one system, then they want to see two council tax bills. If you're heating a business, then they want to see some business rates. Um, again, we've raised with them and they've kind of softened on this slightly in, in previous years in that, well, quite a few people are exempt from business rates or a bed and breakfast uh, if it's under eight rooms doesn't have to apply for business rates. However, you still list them as an example of someone able to benefit from non-domestic RHI. So what do you want? Do you want lots of paperwork that we can't provide or do you want us you know, not, not to participate? So again, it comes down to if we can't provide um, business rates, we can't provide multiple council tax bills proving the non-domestic, then it's about giving off gem sufficient evidence that they feel confident that you're not trying to pull the wool over their eyes. So that would be photographs of why the building has been sufficiently modified away from a single domestic. Typically that, that's things like where you've say you've got a garage that's been converted into a cottage in industry of, of some kind or um, you know, potentially a self-contained granny flat, something like that. Ofgem have said, okay, well, does it have its own separate external entrance? If it, if it does, then it's more likely to be a separate property that you're heating, even though it comes under all council tax bills. So they're kind of willing to work with you, but you have to be able to give them sufficient evidence that they're confident you're not just trying to squeak a domestic through on a non-domestic. That's their major fear. Um, so again, business rates and council tax are, are the ideal. There are other ways of, of doing it. Um, independent meter report, which I haven't covered today, but again, very important um, element uh, necessary, can still be done by. And um, then <laughs> I've spent weeks waiting for this from people before a photocopy of their passport or something that proves who they are and that they own their bank account. Um, again, Ofgem will do most of the checks and then we'll just not do anything until they receive that, so that's very important. Okay, I kind of um, touched on this earlier on today, but buildings. Um, must be fully enclosed um, in order for them to be considered eligible. Uh, apart from process heats, I've mentioned, which can now be done outside. It must be a genuine non-domestic demand. And don't underestimate the, um, the level of uh, due diligence they will do on that word genuine. They, um, they, they really will look in quite a bit of detail at what you're telling them you're heating. Um, all heat losses must still be accounted for unless you've been lucky enough to disregard them because your external pipe work is on the platforms or something outside. Um, so uh, good luck if, if you've done that. Uh, under 45 kilowatts must be MCS and backup is permitted, but it must be declared. So even immersion heaters and thermal stores, you've got to declare them because they're an ineligible heat generation. Off general want to know about that. Um, but in case of non-domestic, that does only refer to the actual connected plant that's all connected to the generator that you're applying for. So I could have another, so a, a better example is, I've got a big heating system that does my uh, heating hot water, however I also have another little electric uh, water point on the wall. I don't have to declare that because it's not connected in any way to the rest of my system. So that's what they're talking about. And going back to your point Nick, if that was a house, I think you would have to declare that because they're looking at the envelope. Um, is that the same part of the electric challenge? 
Uh, in the domestic property, yeah, because it's all contributing to your heating demand on that on that site. So. Uh, sorry, yeah. So just to clarify that non-domestic RHR, if you had a farm, for example, with yeah. heating, I don't know, heating and dairy, water, etc., yeah. and you were also putting that heat into the farmhouse, yeah. will they be able to claim the non-domestic RHR in the farmhouse? Yes. Even so, though it's just a domestic farm. Yeah, so um, it's a really important point I should have said right at the beginning, actually, probably. A lot of people refer to non-domestic RHI as commercial RHI. I, um, I always use that as a little totem in a way because it's not, that's not actually what it's called and it's not actually what they mean. You've got the domestic RHI, which is only interested in a single domestic premise. Anything that isn't that can be considered for the non-domestic RHI. So, Say you've got um, a domestic house, and as I said, you've got uh, a granny flat that's attached to it. That's no longer now a single domestic property. It's now something more. So you're eligible for non-domestic RHI. It's the same with the farm. If you've got a farmhouse, but you legitimately use some of your hot water for farm processes that you can evidence, then that's no longer a single domestic property. It's something more. So you can put it through under the non-domestic property. Or you need to do that, actually. Yes. It's a big five-bed yeah, yeah, because it's, it's not a single domestic premise. So anything that that does that, yeah, yeah. But even with that, you're saying about the granny flat sort of side of things. That's running off the same heating system as the you know the main building. What happens then? Uh, well, again, right. if it's coming off the same heating system, but you can evidence that it's it's actually a separate self-contained unit. Ideally, that would be using council tax to prove that. But if you can't, because it's under the same curtains of the property, or you've negotiated that um, you know, it comes under your council tax because it's you know, used by someone that is just moving out of your house into an annex or whatever, you could still make a claim to Ofgem that they are two separate properties, but you would have to evidence that in a way that they felt was equivalent to council tax. Which is why I mentioned external entrances, um, you know, anything like a separate phone line even, anything that shows that it is more than just a single domestic mm -hmm. premise. So they're pretty, they're pretty good and pretty flexible, and you can phone them up and ask and say, I think this may qualify for non-domestic, this is the sort of evidence I can provide, what do you think? They'll by and large give you a, a pretty honest opinion, so it's well worth doing. I'm going to um, um, race on if that's okay, because I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, this is sort of the broad um, route through. The system has to be commissioned, then you put your application in the object. I know of people that are really, really keen and they want to start their application before the system is actually fully commissioned. You can do that, but um, the system will time you out after three months if you don't touch it. So you're better off just doing it all in one go. Um, and you obviously have to apply with a commissioning certificate attached. So there's no <coughs> time to start an application to be commissioned. Um, oh, my text is going to be wonky. Um, there's three levels of checks that often do, which is why it takes sort of six to twelve weeks depending on how good the application is and, and how happy they are with the evidence. The first level checks are basically have you filled in all the boxes on the application form online that you need to? Have you given us all the evidence? We don't care what the evidence is at this stage. Have you given us all the evidence that we need? They'll do a postcode check to check that it's a real place um, and they'll do another check to just check the MCS if eligible and they'll also check to see if you've got any other kind of plant there. So it's very basic checks um, just to make sure that the application is kind of broadly there with all the information they need. Um, level 2 checks, this is the most detailed bit and often where you'll get phoned by Ofgem for more information. So this is where they're starting to look at your schematics, starting to look at your heat meter placement, starting to check that the photos you've taken of your heat meters match the serial numbers on the descriptive elements of the application. Uh, they'll also be obviously looking at uh, okay, the genuine demand side of things, are you actually a business when you say that you are Etc. Et so that's the period of time where they do the bulk of the right. Let's just check you're eligible. One thing just to say on that though is that often don't consider themselves the council tax police. They're not really in the position to uh, kind of liaise with your local authority. Are oh, they say that they're they're exempt? Are they exempt or not? In some extreme cases, they may they may do that. But there will be a lot of toing and froing beforehand, giving the applicant owner the opportunity to, to kind of demonstrate why they've had this system installed under the non-domestic scheme in the first place. So they're kind of, they're very keen to get systems through because we're under deployment, so they're helpful. 
I think that's the main thing. You may spend a lot of time on the phone, but they are quite helpful. Um, so it's just it's definitely just being aware that at this stage they really do get into the nuts and bolts of your application. And I'll go on to what the significance of that is in a second. Um, the level three checks normally you won't hear any more from Ofgen at this point. It's kind of just making sure they've got the ID, sorting out the bank accounts and setting up the payments. Um, and then your application is accredited. And sometimes it has been as low as kind of four weeks, but more typically it's kind of six to ten. Um, the accreditation date is um, uh, is obviously uh, the date at which they receive a full and complete and correct application. So for some people that will be I wish I had a laser thing. For some people that will be the date at which they make their initial application to Ofgem. This is going back to the digressions thing we were talking about this morning. For others, depending on the case officer, it might be a point at any at any point through that process. So it's just worth being aware that the accreditation date isn't necessarily something that you as an installer or a consumer have any control over. Okay, uh, nearly there. I think I'm sort of catching up. Um, the important points are often want photos. They, they list in their requirements they want photos. So you can't get around it, you have to take them. <laughs> Please make sure that when you take it, you can, they can actually read the bits of information that they're after on this. So uh, I took this one, and it's kind of borderline. You can just about read the, um, the class accuracy on it. You can, kind of, you can read the serial number, and you can read the CE mark. So I think uh, Ofgen were happy with that one, because they could actually read what the information was that I was trying to tell them, i.e. this is an eligible heat meter. So make sure they're clear. Um, another thing that we can say is that we want the heat um, kilowatt hours of picture you take of the heat meter to match what you put in your application. Um, I've sort of dealt with some applications where they haven't matched at all because by the time I've taken a photo and done other stuff and then done the application, they've used up another 100 kilowatt hours or whatever. Um, they don't seem to be as, as kind of picky about that. So that's just one thing to kind of not be too hung up on. Again, serial numbers of everything, just, just take your photos of everything, um, making sure you can read it. Um, so, particularly important with the independent meter report, um, often are starting their audits of, of um, independent meter reports in particular, but also accreditations. Uh, and they found over 10% of the independent meter reports had errors. Pretty serious errors, i.e. different serial numbers in the meter report to, to what is actually on the equipment and the original application, photographs of a, of a heat meter that doesn't actually exist on the, on the system, etc. Um, so um, I think the, the main message from all of this really is don't underestimate the level of diligence often going through for, for these checks. I've got no reason to believe it's going to be any different for the domestic RHI unit. Sorry, yeah? Um, when you're talking about the heat meters and stuff like that, yeah. Something could go wrong with that heat meter in two years' time. Is there a process of updating Ofgem? Yeah. Or yeah. So the, the process is you have to email Ofgem and say something's gone wrong. I'd like to make a change. They then spend a little while thinking about it. They'll then come back to you and go, "Okay, you can make a change. Tell us what you'd like to make the change on." You then go and make the change, or tell them what the change is you're going to do. They then confirm it. You then go ahead and make the change. They put your application, which is now accredited and, and on their system, is saying um, it's accredited. <coughs> They'll then put that back with applicant, and then you amend it with the new serial numbers, the new photographs, and the bit of kit you're replacing, and then resubmit to Ofgen. So you might have to do that. You might have to go to a site, replace the meter yeah. there, there, yeah. because for whatever reason that. You would just have to you would just have to plead your case to Ofgem. I mean, they're, they're pretty sensible. They they class it under something called a material change. They're aware that people want to um, you know boilers break and need completely replacing. They're aware that heat meters um, you know have a have a lifespan. Um, at the moment, I, I don't think their focus was really on how to deal with those changes. So it's not a particularly streamlined process. But the thing to do is just is just keep in touch. Sorry. Just communicate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Um, so this is um, actually some of the slides that I sort of pinched um, to do with the meter report. So on the heat meter calculator, it actually states uh, where the flow meter is. It says it's in a return pipe. In actual fact, it's fitted on the flow pipe. Ofgem hate this kind of thing because you know it's not obvious to them which one is right. They have to go back to you and get clarification. Potentially, there's actually a hardware change to do here now to make it all match up. And the more often don't like the look of something, the more they'll look into it. And 
and sort of be all right if there's mistakes there or anywhere else there are mistakes. So it really is totally important to make sure that you've got everything in front of you and you do the application and it's, it's, it's there, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and everything matches, so serial numbers match, and things say they are where they actually are. Um, yeah, again, a couple more errors. Um, this one was a bit of an odd one. Uh, the sensor head is incorrectly oriented. I wasn't quite sure why that was an issue, but again, they instructed someone to go out and change it. Um, so they, they don't have any qualms about sort of saying, well, it's ineligible as it is, so go and do something about it and come back to us. Uh, okay, so just to, to um, finish with-ish, uh, what would be eligible about this? Or what bits of this building would be eligible under the one test car child? Okay, yeah. Closed section because it's fully enclosed. Um, you could potentially do some drying or some commercial cleaning in the open bit. Uh, what's the problem with this building? Yeah, it's not fully enclosed. It's got a door, you could expect there to be a door, but it's also got enormous big holes inside the wall. Um, so, again, being kind of uh, aware of what off gem are after in their applications is absolutely important. If you took a picture of this, you may consider them relatively small openings compared to the size of the building. And well, the door's open all the time anyway, so what does it matter? We well, probably didn't tell off gem in the application that the door was open all the time. So it's kind of just being aware about A, what the actual regulations are. So to my mind, that probably isn't eligible anyway because they are quite big openings unless you cover them. And B, just be aware of what off-jam are actually looking for. Uh, again, another issue with the um, independent meeting report not matching up with what um, the other evidence says. Okay, we are, we are really near the end now. You did really well. Lots of no, nodding heads yet, which is good. Um, so the application form itself does have some kind of text, some free-form text bits where you have to describe what the system is. Um, again, don't, don't try and type that on the application because it will it'll log you out after five minutes and you'll lose it all. You know, again. So again, basic things, but just make sure you've typed all that stuff out beforehand. And make sure it matches with what the schematics are saying, what your photos say, what the independent metering reports say. Because um, they will check. And they, they've got no idea about your system. As I said, it lands on their desk in a heap of paper and they'll thumb through it. If it doesn't tell a coherent story, they'll be asking questions. All the evidence must be converted to PDF because that's the only thing the system will take. Um, and uh, doing all of these kind of things in the way that I've suggested can actually save you weeks on, on the application process. Um, and yeah, it will save you a significant amount of time if you do what I've generally expected. This is how it looks, probably the world's most boring slide in the whole world, but that's, that's how it looks. It's quite a um, basic interface. Uh, <laughs> and we'll time you out quite quickly, so if you kind of answer a phone call and then go back to it, we'll happily type, click next, and it will have you out and lost all your changes. Quite frustrating. So always click next after filling something in for it to save your changes. If you filled out a load of information and then go, oh, I'll, just, I'll just check what I put in the previous one, and click previous, you lose all your changes. Um, if you wait 12 weeks before making, before logging into the account, it will erase it entirely, which is helpful. Uh, again, I can't really comment on how similar the domestic process is going to be to this. Personally, I can't imagine that Ofgem forked out money for a, an online interface and then we fork out a load more money for a separate online interface for the domestic. So, my opinion is they, they may well have a kind of cut down, slightly more streamlined version of this system. Um, streamlined because it uses MCS and because it uses other things. They don't have to ask quite as many questions. It's likely to be the same kind of clunky interface. Okay, that's it. Um, as I've said, there are other Ready for Retrofit events available, so um, if this hasn't completely put you off, then by all means take a look at what's coming up um, and engage in further support. We're all here now over lunch and for the next hour or so, so please um, come and chat to us. Failing that, it's the Renewal Engine Marketplace in April, not too far away. Um, if anyone's interested in further details on that, come and see us. Um, thank you very much for your patience uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you all again soon I'm sure.